Welcome to Middle Fingers Up, the show where we hold our heads high and our middle fingers higher. I'm your host, Kieran McKay. Today we are talking with Dr. Ryan Emmons from Cadence Chiropractic and Sports Therapy. Dr. Ryan is an authority on pain, injuries, upper cervical instability, and functional foam rolling. And we're all going to find out what that means because I'm sure, like me, a lot of us have no idea what those words mean. So we asked Dr. Ryan to join us today to discuss the link between chronic pain and our mental health. So we're really excited to have you here today. Thank you. Welcome. I'm just going to do the little thing where I got to unmute you guys. So I also have my lovely husband, Carrie McKay, sitting here as well. So uh, welcome to you as well. Thanks for uh, sitting here on a Saturday afternoon. So Thanks how are you guys doing? Us. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so I'm going to, I have a lot of questions. I want to get into a lot of stuff. So we're just going to like business it out and jump right into it. So we're going to start with our middle fingers up segment. So I'm going to get Carrie to go first today and tell us what, what do you got on your mind? Well, it's not going to be earth shattering, <laughs> but my middle fingers up this week will be to people not hanging up the phone. Oh. When you phone. Okay. Like, so you, you both have cell phones. You yes. phone somebody. Yeah. And like, say I'm busy or mowing the lawn or doing whatever, and then I go to hang up, but I can't reach my phone because I have gloves on or something, and you can't hang up, but the other person never hangs oh. up. Oh. And so it's just on the whole time. Then I have to take my gloves off. And there's one person in particular that does this. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. They may be in this room. Yeah. Dr. Ryan, <laughs> Carrie's always calling you. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> so anyway, like I said, not earth shattering, but it, yeah. it's an annoyance, I guess. So, okay. Yeah. Well, point well taken. Thank you very much for the not so subtle hints. Welcome to our marriage right here, Dr. Ryan. This is this is pretty much how it is. So uh, what about you? What do you want to put your middle fingers up to? Well, I don't want to be overly negative, but uh, in terms of what we're talking about today, yeah. uh, I would say I want to give my middle fingers up to standard care. Ooh. What do you mean? Because so many people are in pain. Yeah. And we're not helping them. Mm -hmm. And there can be better. Yeah. And we don't have to struggle. Yeah. I think that's a excellent thing to put your middle finger up to. That was a lot to. better than mine, for sure. Yeah. I, I'm like almost <laughs> wanting to give mine up, too. Because mine's like, <laughs> mine was about mergers. So I'll just leave it at that. Like mergers and acquisitions? or? Uh, no, definitely not that. But the kind that when you're merging, you're on Deerfoot, the oh, okay. lovely highway. And people, you can tell a lot about people's personality when they merge, like how confident they are, how they second guess themselves. There's been a few incidents in the last week with icy roads and just almost got caught in between hitting someone and then being hit. And there was four, like, I would have been a four, one of those four or five car pileups. And so I was pretty upset with that. So, it wasn't my fault. It was the other people, obviously. Of course. Yeah, of course. yeah, yeah. So, middle so maybe up. it's you being in the wrong lane. No. Maybe if you see a merge lane, you go it's over to the possible. middle. And then I got all my driving mergers. advice from you. So <laughs> maybe it's not me. Yes. It's the others. But anyways, we'll so I, I regret now sharing mine to you because <laughs> I, I agree with what you're saying. And I think this is sort of why we're here today as well mm -hmm. to talk about what what can we as individuals do to learn about our health, whether it be your mental well-being or physical well-being, and how do we start to take charge and even maybe start to build a bit of an awareness of what's happening? Because a lot of today's talk is about sometimes we don't even recognize we're in pain and sometimes we think this is the way it's supposed to be. And so to, to have something like that happen with physical pain, there's there has to be impacts on our well-being if we're living mm -hmm. that way and and so I look forward to this conversation today. But before we do that, let's let's learn a little bit about you because on your website, your uh, Cadence Chiropractic website, there, there's a long list of trainings and certifications and all sorts of stuff. So I didn't know like I'd be listing everything off, and so I thought, why would I do that? Why not ask you? Let's talk about that. Depends on how deep we want to get. Oh, well. well we ultimately, when people ask me what I do, I like to simplify and I just, I treat pain. Yeah. 
That's what I do because everything else is just noise around that and it won't resonate with most people. Yeah. So yeah. ultimately, uh, it's, a th- it's about the pain. Yeah. On your website too, there's a lot of talk about how uh, people can learn to not live with that pain, learn to no longer have to deal with that. Uh, you, you, you have a lot of experience in the sports world as well. So I think you did some work with NHL players mm-hmm. and CFL players. I'd love to hear more. Like, how did how did you get into uh, your sort of line of work? Because there's lots of different ways chiropractors can practice. Uh, mm-hmm. Your sort of story, and we'll talk about why Carrie's here in a second, is a little unique. Uh, and so I'd love to hear, how did you decide that this was the line of work for you? This is what you're going to do. Initially, it was just because I had pain and a chiropractor corrected my pain. Mm. Took it away. Yeah. When I was in high school and I was working out, and I had back pain. And... It helped me. Yeah. It kept me going. I was like, oh, I could do this. Yeah. I don't have to sit behind a desk and, and do those things. I could be moving around, yeah. helping people in this way. I thought that was that would be great. Right. And keep in mind that in the way I practice, it is a huge evolution from where it began. Ah. And that's the thing. You have to want better. Yeah. You have to pursue better. You can't just read out of a book and you know reproduce that all the time. Yeah. There's a box and you have to exist out of that box if yeah. you're going to do what I do. Yeah. So tell me, how do you exist outside of that box? Like, what do you do? Whatever it takes to get somebody better. You have to ask questions. Most people don't ask questions. They don't ask the right questions uh, or any questions at all. If somebody's not getting better, Mm -hmm. you have to ask why. Yeah. If you're not asking why, you shouldn't be treating anybody. Right. So are you saying coming back for frequent uh, adjustments, is that sort of what you're talking about? Like to to return to the office and come see you and get regular adjustments. Part of your job in there is to figure out why do you keep coming back? Yes. What's that about? Yeah, because that's that's sort of what I know, Carrie, you're going to chat about this in a minute, but that's sort of what really got me curious about you and Carrie, you know, met you and, and worked with you. Uh, he even mentioned that your job was to never have him come back again. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what? That that like you said earlier with your middle fingers up, that doesn't exist in our medical world. Mm-hmm. We don't we don't have the capacity anymore. It seems like for medical professionals to really take their time and get to the root of the problem. And so it sounds like that's what you're doing. So yep. how come you're doing that? Like how how is it that you decide to do that? Because that doesn't happen often. It doesn't. It, it's a personal thing for me. You know, as much as we want to separate ourselves from patient outcomes, yeah. I couldn't. Yeah. You know, I'd go home many years ago when results weren't the same. Yeah. And I'd sit there and think, well, why is this person not getting better? And it would sit with me and I thought, it can't be this way. Yeah. And there's always been that one patient that has made you think like, shouldn't there be better for this person? Right. Because it's affecting their life their ability to do things, they chalk it up to, oh, I should just stop doing what I love to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, that's really? that's what I remember. My mother has mega back issues. Maybe mm-hmm. she needs to see you. She's had a lot of surgeries. <laughs> and that's sort of what she was told mm-hmm. for years. And she was very young. So we were young. And she was told, well, you have to give those things up. And she's a very active woman, whether it's working out, gardening, those kinds of things. And so that what like can you imagine having to give up the things that you get up for every day Mm -hmm. because that's sort of the outcome is it won't get better if you keep doing those things and i get some things sure certain kind of heavy lifting those kinds of things for whatever reason or muscle strength body can't take it but when you're told well the only solution here is that you have to stop doing all the other things and then live with the pain like Mm -hmm. what what, but it's so interesting because that is the opposite message that i give to people now yeah you know, the biggest thing that I do when the people come in pain and they ask me, can I still exercise? Yeah. I always say yes. Yeah. And I look at them and I always ask them, why do I say yes? Because I like to pose a lot of questions because I make them think uh-huh. instead of it just be my opinion. Right. I never say, this is my opinion. I'm right. Well, yeah. everybody has an opinion. That's right. <laughs> and I tell them, I say, you're not injured. Oh. You're not injured. So of course you can stay active because I can walk people through an active recovery to a limit But if you're not injured, therefore a muscle is not torn, Mm. a bone is not broken, can you still stay active? Is that actually better for your overall recovery? The answer is yes, Uh. because I've painted a picture and I have a solution for them to get out of pain. So we have a plan. Right. So you can keep going. It's just that most people don't have a true understanding of the condition 
and a path forward. Right. If you have a path forward with a true understanding, you should know, will this person hurt themselves? Yeah. But most people actually don't. Yeah. Yeah. And why why is that? Because most people don't know how to diagnose. Mm. Which means scary. what is the condition? Yeah. Right? And so a lot of people will chase pain. Right. Right? Not dive into it or find the source of it, which will help you control the recovery. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There's so much uncertainty. Yeah. With that. So when when you talk about the the chase the pain or find the fix and ask get to the bottom, like again, how do you decide that that's the route you're going to go? And and when you can't find, I'm oh, sorry, I asked like ten questions in one, so just answer whichever one this. you want. We got this. <laughs> um, so when when someone's sitting there before you and you maybe they keep coming back and you're not you haven't quite figured out what the root cause is, like how do you keep feeling motivated to do that and not just say, well, maybe there isn't like, maybe this is it. We've done everything we can here. How come there's, how is it that there's always a solution? Cause that's not the world I grew up in. Yes. For me, I, this is cause I'm going to tell you everything. I always tell my patients cause I, I go through these things all the time. I have a systematic way of treating people, not a symptomatic way of treating people. Okay. What's that? Systematic yeah. means I have an order. And this is when, you know, I go and I, I teach people, this is how I tell them to structurally see a person so that you can look at everything because the human body, is, especially the muscular system, mm. has a structure to it. Mm. So here's my order. Nerve, muscles, ligaments, joints. Nerves, muscles, ligaments, joints. What yep. does that mean? <laughs> if you go out of that order for treating, yeah. which is a functional approach, yeah. you'll start over again. Oh. That's it. Yeah. Because where do most people start? Second, yeah, third, well, and even definitely fourth. not nerves. Mm. Nerves is like your you don't you have to get like a specialist referral, and no. that's when you're like in the hospital because you, you go for a massage. Nerve. Yes, so, so that's you start muscle. with the muscle uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, or you yeah. go to a chiropractor; they'll start with the joint. That is fourth in line. So this is where when you ask me what do I do, yeah, yeah, I'm a functional practitioner. Hmm. What that means is I restore the body in that order, functionally. So, because when we start talking about, oh, what is this hype yeah. functional term? Yeah. It's a restorative term. If I'm going to restore function mm -hmm. to the body, I will restore nerve function, which feeds the muscles. Mm -hmm. Muscles stabilize ligaments. Ligam ligaments stabilize the joints. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that and you are not restoring the function of each of those things, you are unstable in some fashion. Right. How do you explain that to patients that maybe have lost hope or, you know, for some reason show up to see you and think mm -hmm. this isn't going to work because all the other treatments didn't? What, how, how do you help them, your, your patients, understand that and see that? I don't explain. Is, uh, I demonstrate. Oh, like by doing? By I show like, them. Mm. I show them because yeah. the thing is, is what I do is a lot of muscle testing, which okay. is motor testing, okay. which is nerve testing. Right. Because nerves, when they feed a muscle, comes with motor, sensory, and reflex. Okay. Right? Yeah, That's what like we have to do. Big I, school lesson going on here. I gotta write I these know. notes down. <laughs> so, what I do is I check those muscles to see that they are working well. Is the brain sending a full signal to the muscle? Can I test that? Yes, it's testable. Mm -hmm. If we don't test, we guess. Then, mm -hmm. guess what most people are doing? Because most people are not testing. Yeah. yeah, they don't test. They don't test accurately. They don't test an array of things. But why not? Why don't they? I don't know. Like that, that, if that blows my mind that it's like almost we're talking that what you're doing is unique. Unfortunately, it is. I don't know why a lot of people don't test or they don't do the right test yeah. or it's not in their wheelhouse of testing. Well, how, then how but did you get here then? How did you get to this side? Like, you, this must be what you're saying about being outside the box. Then, mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It is. Okay. Because so, you have to test because it takes more time. Yeah. Time mm -hmm. is money. But for time me, it's not money. about money. Yeah. For me, it's about results. I prefer having a great reputation yes. over having a booming business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because I would say if, if you if you measured them, you'd say my reputation is way up here. Business yeah. is good. Yeah. But I'd rather reputation. Does a lot of this outside of the box, a lot of this have to do with the injury you talked about when you were young, when you were 15? Like, because you, it sounds like you, you had a fix. I did, but that was traditional care that okay. happened to work for me, which is great because 
Some people go for traditional care yeah. and get better. Okay. Awesome. Mm-hmm. But that is only a portion. Right. The rest are left to struggle or live a yeah. lifestyle of managing it. I have patients that come in and live a lifestyle of just finding that one practitioner or mm-hmm. treatment that gives them hope because it gives them the best results they've had, yeah. but they still have pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm like, is, is that enough for you? Yeah. Is this what you want to do of spending all your time and money yeah. driving to appointments? I don't. I agree, but when you, when you only have so many, uh, you know, if you have benefits, you only have so many sessions that you can put towards it. And if it decreases your pain, I'm sure a lot of people out there would say, well, I'll take it because, mm-hmm. because it's like, you're a unicorn. Like you don't, this doesn't exist. The idea of, I can actually fix something here. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to just maintain, I'm going to manage. I'm, and that might even be with meds and then that might be with other things. And so, and then it just gets to a point where sometimes in my mind, when I, when I, and I've lived with people with chronic pain, I've, I've been around it. I I've seen it. I think many of us either have experienced or been around it. And when you see somebody experiencing pain like that, there's like this little line in the sand that once they cross it, they're done, they're gone. They're in this place of, I'm never getting better this is the way it is, this is how it's going to be, and that's just it. And and then it's just a storm of what happens after with their relationships, with their own well-being, right, and their quality of life. And so mm-hmm. I, I, when you say that, I think, yeah, it makes sense. If I'm paying $100 to get something from you, but I'm only getting 70% from you. Mm-hmm. It, like, why would I do that? You know, it's like mm-hmm. buying a perfume bottle and saying, well, I'll pay this much for it, only get, you know, it a quarter full. And But that's how a lot of us are living, mm-hmm. thinking that, well, you know, and, and Carrie, for you as well, I think that that's how it was for you for years. Like, oh, you felt really good for a short period of time when you'd have yeah, a treatment, right. right? And then you think, okay, this is the way it's going to be. Well, it'd be set up as a monthly thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you go to the dentist, they book out yeah, six, months. six months right so i'd go to the chiropractor and you know they'd be like okay see you next week yeah okay because it was really bad so now you got to go every week and then you went every two weeks and then you went every month and then just come back every month yeah always just come back every month for an adjustment and it was working yeah. but within that month it's not like the pain decreased a ton yeah. it just alleviated it that month right and if i can go into my story. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was yeah. going to interject. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. I love, I love that, this. That's, that's, that's a good thing to say. One thing I'm going to say is that for me, I will never say I can fix everybody because there are some people that just, my goal is to make them their best. Yeah. You know, it's one yeah. of those things that I'll never get in somebody's mind. I'm yeah. going to fix them. Right. But I'm going to make it so that they're better than they've ever been. Mm-hmm. And that is my goal. A lot yeah. of the times, yes, I yeah. do fix. But right. I can never guarantee that. Well, you that can't to somebody. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. 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 And the problem with going monthly that we get this interpretation that okay, it's helping at the time, which is good. Mm-hmm. But in Carrie's case, and in many others, in the long run, it's actually making things worse. How? Because if we talk about his case, where there was some laxity yeah. and some instability, which eventually had accelerated and revealed itself and couldn't sustain, and we kept seeing a recurrence of those. That acceleration is from other treatments like adjustments. Mm. I can give an example. Yes, please. I had a friend who had come to me for years and an array of, of symptoms. They can have digestive symptoms, body pains. She had headaches, hormonal issues, mm. a variety of things. We were able to treat till she had a high quality of life. Right. Now, we had to go through the process of treating her instability of her neck, right, just like Carrie did, Mm -hmm. and we were very successful. Now, she lives in High River. Mm -hmm. So she's in High River, and she has benefits, and she thought, you know what? I want to do well for my health. I'm going to go for monthly adjustments Mm -hmm. on my neck. Right. Completely unwound that treatment. We had to start over. Wow. Yeah. So what I remind people is that you have to understand your diagnosis and stay within that moving forward. Mm -hmm. But just because a treatment is good symptomatically, it doesn't mean it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean it can't worsen in the future or become a problem. So can you, I know, Carrie, we want to get to your story, but I just want to ask, what do you mean by the piece about not sustainable? The treatment effects have to hold. 
Yeah. They have to progress and they have to hold because you should be out of pain. Yeah. Or if it is any of the other symptoms that we'll get into, like digestive or anxiety or anything, yeah. wherever we get to, which is somebody's best, right. must hold there. Yeah. You shouldn't keep trying to tinker with sustaining that. It just needs to hold. So that's what I was remembering in a conversation you had said, it only heals if it holds. Correct. Mm. So that's so how when you I, know. Totally. Okay. When I talk about that yeah, yeah. now, because we're always going to go over the systematic way of treating right. instead of just rubbing where it hurts. Yeah. Or if you lack this, you give this. Like, it's just a okay, very traditional way. What was that again? Way. Nerves? Nerves, Nerves muscles, muscles, ligaments, ligament, joints. joints. Okay. Nerve, yeah. muscles, ligaments, joints. So, because people come to me yeah. and I remind most people that that a lot of the pain, especially chronic pain, is nerve-based, right? Nerves are persistently irritated mm -hmm. and they are hypersensitized. Mm. So when people have pain that is at a level that doesn't make sense to a trauma or something like that, right. I'm like, well, where, where's the disconnect? Why yeah. is it mismatched? Like mm. you're saying, if, if you didn't have a traumatic car accident that caused this physical yes. pain... Where is it coming from? Exactly. But that's Why is it not getting better? Do muscles not heal? So one question, because I like my patients to often think about things that I'm saying. Yes. So it's partly their idea, partly what I'm well, saying. Well, that's how you get buy-in. That's how well, therapy works. Totally. Yeah. But here's the thing. How long does it take to, for a bone to heal if you fracture it? A clean break. Tell me right? that. Yeah. Eight weeks likely. Eight weeks. Yeah. Six to eight. Yeah, yeah. Six yeah. to eight weeks. I've told you this. Unless if you're and Wolverine. I've told, I've told one immediate. of every single one of my buddies the same thing. Yeah. When they're like... Oh, I'm sore or blah, blah, blah. Like, anyway, I'm going into my story. Yes. <laughs> which, let's do that. But that's the thing. Why do we still have muscle pain? It makes yeah. no sense. Yeah. But because you didn't go nerve, muscles, ligaments, joint, that nerve is persistently irritated. Yeah. And then just keeps feeding into that muscle. Yeah. Because now I'm treating the muscle, getting a massage. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's Temporary actually making relief. it worse. Absolutely. Yeah. Because if you're not functional, the reality of the situation is you are actually healing. Yeah. It's just that you're hurting more than you're healing it every day. Right. It's happening every day. Sleep, activity, all these things. Mm -hmm. So treatment should be very simple. Tip those scales. Hmm. Heal more than you hurt and yeah. you'll get better. Hmm. It's actually quite simple. And so if you mm -hmm. correct that nerve yeah. irritation problem, Guess what's going to happen? All of those subsequent things yeah. can we'll start get, to change. Yeah, get better. Yeah, and that sort of. Do you want to get? Do you want to dive into that? Well, I just had one question then. Yeah. So, and this is my understanding: pain relief or drugs? Mm -hmm. Do they help nerve pain? Like, will they lessen nerve pain? There are some drugs, like say ibuprofen, like no. off the over the counter. Well, a nerve can be irritated, so yeah. to some mild degree. But most of the time, I do know that there's a nerve origin when it's quite inflamed because mm. medications don't work. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm. Can it? I've experienced where ibuprofen has, because I've been through most of these issues. I've seen where ibuprofen is the thing that just helped. And that's where I'm not always like, that's the answer. But right. sometimes we need it. You need yeah. something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Why struggle? But no, it, it can't deal with that because typically when we see a nerve problem, it's a compression site mm. or an irritation site. I don't like the word pinched nerve or anything yeah. like that. That sounds like damage and injury. But something can be irritated or compressed, but that is persistent. Mm. And you must relieve that right. in order for things to go from there. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And would you treat that the same way as a tra trauma injury? Like if, if the nerve was hurt through a car accident versus I'm coming in because of car accident, but let's say Carrie's coming in because we, we don't know yet how that happened. Do you treat it the same or do you treat the trauma different than... It's all the same. Yeah. Systematic. Yeah. Nerve, um, muscles, ligaments, right. joints. And Nerve, and muscles, ligaments, joints. Yeah. Right? It's just because we need to relieve the severity yeah. to keep things going. Right. So you can't just say, oh, I'm going to treat this sprain. Yes, yeah. Without treating the area to make sure that the muscles are protecting it. Right. And that those muscles have good function. Yeah. Good quality strength mm. to stabilize and protect everything that needs to happen, which comes from nerve flow. Right. Because if that nerve is impaired in some way going to that muscle, you, yeah, you're going to start over. Yeah. 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 You have yeah. to. Yeah. 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 And that's sort of what happened for you, right? Yeah, and so how I I guess why we're here. Yeah, why are so why we're are you sitting... here today, Kira? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a deep answer. Um, so we're sit. I'd go for lunch, yeah. and 
multiple times. There's a time in my past where lunch was almost a daily occurrence through work through or whatever. Work, yeah. And uh, uh, one of my friends, Richard A. <laughs> <laughs> this is Gary making fun of me from the last couple episodes. <laughs> Obviously, he's noticed me rub my shoulder, rub my back, or just like, you know, do that whole movement of your shoulder, like, or, or your neck, or cracking your neck. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he noticed something. And he's like, hey, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to get some help with that, you, you should go see my guy. <laughs> and I'm like, everybody has a guy. Yes, <laughs> right? And I'm everybody like, does. yeah, I've, I went down this road. <laughs> it's okay. I'll just go and do my monthly regime, right? Yeah. He said something like, yeah, well, you know, he fixed my knee. And then that was the end of the conversation. Then like a couple lunches later or later, it was in my brain. It was already like the, the spider laid the egg and, the, and it was just like, now like multiplying, right? <laughs> and so I, br- I brought it up next time because obviously I'm still in pain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pocket full ibuprofen. Yeah. Right? Like Ibis. I had a nickname for Ibis. Like yeah, for- like every time I do laundry, <laughs> I'd hear bing like in the, in the washer or the machine because Carrie always had Tylenol. His Advil yeah. or Tylenol in his pocket. Mm-hmm. with his knife that he Saskatchewanians <laughs> always carry with them. Yeah, oh, you always have had ibuprofen yeah. in your car, in your... Yeah, your, it was just yeah. a normal thing. Yeah. Because 13 car accidents later, or whatever it was when I counted last, um, not any recently, so... Yes, good. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I brought it up to him. Okay, Rich, it's been on my mind. And then he tells me the stories. Well, I had my knee, and I roll it, and we explain how we explain. Not obviously, like know you would explain it but he's explaining it to me just well you roll it out and then my shoulder was messed up last week or sorry last month and I rolled it out about for three weeks and he's like I could have probably went in and got it fixed a little quicker but I knew the rolling was working the two weeks or whatever he rolled it for and it was fine and so I'm like okay well when's the last time you've been to him and I'm thinking last week or two weeks ago or whatever it was Mm -hmm. for his knee or for his adjustment he's like two years ago Hmm. or something I'm like what He's like, well, yeah, he fixed it. You just can fix things. And that obviously in, in what I had been doing for 20 years, yeah. chiropractic, 20 years mm-hmm. going different people, whatever. And, and mm-hmm. again, alleviating the symptoms, which was fine. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I never thought of a fix. And I didn't think I needed to be fixed until it continually was getting worse. Yeah. Which I didn't notice because it was so incremental. Mm-hmm. But then you notice you're doing the ibuprofen, whatever. Well, and now other people are noticing because they're cracking your neck and, yeah. you know, well, adjusting For somebody to, to pick it up while yeah. you're at lunch, obviously, yeah. that's not good. Yeah. So, yeah. So, anyways, then finally, probably another month or two later, I finally contacted Dr. Ryan. So, why why do you think there was still that month or two that you waited? Yeah, just a toxic masculinity thing. Like, I, I'm good. I'm better. I'm yeah. fine. It'll get better. Mm, yeah, I think that's like... It's Rub good. some dirt on it, as Cam <laughs> yeah, would say. Yeah, as Cam would say, with <laughs> yeah. the tar. It's interesting that you say the toxic masculinity thing, because I think it's also really important to highlight that there's these two dudes or however many you at lunch, and you're actually talking about something that's fit hurting. Because yeah. it's not... From my experience, it's not common that men and and even my experience with you, yeah, you you would really go there, talk about that, talk about well, going to the doctor. Yeah. I mean, you go to lunch things. every day. You finally break some. I think that's great into some stuff because I think there's people it. that wouldn't even do that. I think yeah. that's great that uh, good for him to notice that and bring that up. But that's how confident. But again, he for was. him to bring it up and tell me and say go to it. Yes, of course, everyone has a guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. But to keep not keep pushing because he didn't do that. But yeah. just to explain it very succinctly and easily, you've explained it, the break the bone thing. Mm-hmm. Like you break a bone and you're better in eight, six to eight weeks. Mm-hmm. Why aren't you better yeah, if you're I know. going every month? Mind baffling. Like it takes eight weeks. Like you said, six to eight weeks. And but yet, this is 20 years. So why, ha- why aren't you mended yet? Yeah. Unless you're re-injuring it every day. Like I'm pole vaulting or something crazy, yeah. right? right? But I'm not. You're not. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, the journey led me here yeah. where now... I mean, we definitely went through some steps, but it wasn't that long. No. It, w- it was a process, as they always have to be, yeah. just because mm-hmm. when you meet somebody, you don't know what's going to happen, and you don't want to jump in and say, well, this is the answer. Right. Well, you yeah. paint a picture. I said, you know, this is it, but this is where it can go, but we're just going to walk through and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we had a timeline. Like, yeah. as soon as I, mm-hmm. I, I think maybe after the second, maybe even the first is, okay, you're going to be here for four treatments or mm-hmm. six treatments, and then that should be it. And then you should see if you hold. Yeah. And then whatever. And then I went to Disneyland and went on some stupid rides and wrecked my neck. Anyway, so 
step back. But also good for you for going on rides because that was a different thing you were overcoming. Yeah, that's another story. (laughs) Uh, Can I go back? But it is good because I tell people to challenge things. You don't want to just get fixed and and not move your neck. Yeah. Right. Right. You don't do the robot and be like, okay, I'm just going to protect my neck and not move at all. And I'm not going to do my normal daily activity things that I want to do. Yeah. Well, I tell people you got to live because if you don't, you're not going to expose what is actually going on there, which I needed you to do. Right. To say, okay, what is actually happening yeah. here? Because not everything is seen on an x-ray yeah. or an MRI. Some of yes. these things have to be tested. This is why yeah. when I get an x-ray report, it says, you know, you have to correlate it with your clinical findings and do all that. And that's yeah. how we take good care of people. Right. Just because you see a disc bulge on an MRI does not mean that that's the symptom. Yeah. And we can't get into that mindset. It's like, does that correlate with the findings? And if it doesn't, because we've seen so many, yeah. so much research and lots of evidence that as soon as people see that, they're like, that's my problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And they'll but just talk it searching up. for a fix, right? Like you're so you know desperate that you're like, Hey, this is it. This is what it's going to be. And I think when you're searching for that fix for like you in that situation, Carrie, it's like, why would I want to go and do this again when I already know, like yeah. you, you had already told Richard in that, in that I already done this. Like I'm the expert of this. I've done this. I could, I could be that doctor now. Cause I, I know how to adjust and all that. And I wanted to ask you, Dr. Ryan. So now it's a month or two later, he calls and he shows up. So like what, I don't know if you remember, cause you see a lot of patients, but what Carrie is probably one of many of your patients that finally show up. And so what's that conversation like? Are they coming? Are your patients coming in with their I'll back I'll tell you up? what I thought. Okay, I'm let's, like, yeah. Wait a minute, before you do yeah, that, okay. let's see what he, he okay. got from but you. But it depends yeah, which treatment. It depends if, if it's on the first relapse yeah. or like the third or fourth. Uh, okay, let's start with the after first. After the, the, the prolo yeah. conversation, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's start with the first because I, ha- I think we, you, we probably could share a similar story about that third time but yeah. first time this patient is walking in i expect it i expect it with chronic issues yeah. and trauma mm-hmm. and that sort of thing we are trying to create change it's not like you go to the work uh, do a workout you do a workout a couple times and everything sustains yeah. and it's just like wait i'm strong now right there yeah. is a process of things adapting in the body yeah. and if somebody's had trauma or it's been there a long time which means it's chronic depending on the severity all those variables come into play yeah. and so when he comes in it's like okay we're just we're working on it again because yeah. this is part of the process to see what your condition truly is yeah. in order for us to have a clear picture on how to fix it yeah. mm-hmm. so when he comes in I'm, at the beginning, for me, it's always funny because there's so many patients that are, are, are like ready to have this conversation with me. I'm like, yeah, it's normal. Yeah. Okay, let's treat. Yeah. You know, I don't make a big deal of it yeah. because it's not a big deal. They're right. not injured. I understand it's frustrating. I have truly lived it. Yeah. But I know that there is an end to it. So I'm just like, I don't let them get in that hole. Yeah. I'm like, okay, this is normal. Let's keep going. Right. Right? Because if you go down, it's like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. This, I don't do that. Yeah. yeah. My job is yeah. reassurance because right. I know that I can get them there. Yeah. So I just like, yeah, this is to be expected. Yeah. Let's keep going. Right. Well, and there, I would imagine there's also, actually, before I get to that question, what, what was, was your first experience? So there? the first like, experience was like, okay, here we go again. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm going to be here every month for the rest of my life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But that's not what Rich A said. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, let's yeah. obviously, and at that point I was in enough pain to it wasn't the, so I'm I went and I was in enough pain to go mm-hmm. and to be like okay let's yeah. fix this yeah. but I do remember going back and being in so much mm-hmm. pain that was the second mm-hmm. time I like okay I should actually and this is a point we should probably get into and I think you are into like the patients um what the patient should be doing mm-hmm. like it's not just you, Dr. Ryan, that's doing the work. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a two way street here, right? Anyway, Absolutely. I didn't do the work. Mm-hmm. Yet. Anyway, but when you're in that much pain, I can see why the pain industry is so uh, lucrative. Yeah. Because I was willing to give, like, I'll just hear it's like thousands of dollars. I don't care. Just fix it. Like, give me a fix right now. And I can see why the drugs, mm-hmm. you will go down that road too, mm-hmm. because it was so bad mm-hmm. that I it didn't matter. You just if you could find a fix, I'll pay you mm-hmm. money or I'll take that drug for the rest of my life because I don't want this is really bad. Like it was bad. Yeah. And I just as a family member living in the home with you too, like 
I was talking when we were preparing, Dr. Ryan and I were talking and I was like, sometimes for family members, we're held hostage too. It's like your chronic pain is like all of ours or we're walking around eggshells because we don't want to upset you, disrupt you. We're like, okay. And as well as we feel bad, right? Like it was, I remember because Dr. Ryan and I were having a conversation preparing and he mentioned uh, one of the times that you, I think it was a repeat, this mm. this kind of got to start over time that you went back in After and he's Disneyland. like, he remembered seeing you in the office. And in I'm the like, waiting room, you yeah, were sitting there and yeah. I was like, this will be a good conversation. Oh, yeah. 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 And I was like, you know what? I remember that Wednesday because you go on Wednesdays because when you left that house, we had a rough morning. And mm -hmm. when you left the house, it was good luck, Dr. Ryan is what I said in my head because I'm like, oh, he's going to show up there. And and you can see it. And, you can, and like the other part of that, too, is I think when you're dealing with so much pain, you don't have the capacity sometimes to even recognize what how that's leaking out to the rest of your world, how that's leaking out to your in your job with your mm -hmm. you know the quality well, I can look of your back life, now, yeah, for sure, and be like, man, sure. I was a dick. Hindsight's a bitch, though, right? You only <laughs> have so much like capacity of like um, tolerance. Yeah, tolerate tolerating things. So yeah. if I, if my cup's already full, and I'm dealing with kids or you or whoever, yeah, it's now overflowing and overflowing. That's where the dickishness comes out, I guess, if that's a... Oh, ever. your pain is actively, yeah, it's coming mm -hmm. out in that way, absolutely. But to be fair, especially yeah. when we deal with a neck issue, mm -hmm. it's not just pain, mm. right? Because it's a neurological right. issue that affects brain function. Okay, and this is why this. we get into the emotional side of this. So not only is it the impact of pain, say somebody has back pain, yeah. but when we talk about the neck, it yeah. is like way bigger. Yeah. It is amplified it, it, it is a lot more neurologically because then we get the effects of the neck up on the brain mm -hmm. and going down in the body and because the neck affects the brain stem all those things you are automatically tired more tired mm -hmm. excessively Caring. you are more irritable your check. coping mechanism mechanisms are down yeah sleep quality will change oh, check so you're you're dysregulated yeah. and we know sleep is so important and you can see how it's just a domino effect it's not just pain mm -hmm. but your coping mechanisms internally are compromised and then it just goes from there and and yes. i've i've lived it where not all of your symptoms are pain it can just be irritability yeah i would know when i had my issues because i was extremely short with my kids yeah. and people around me and i would just think like what the heck yeah. i'd be walking to work i love my job it's not that stressful mm -hmm. and i had a tummy of anxiety i'm like right. why am i nervous yeah and I'm just thinking, like, what is going on yeah. in my body to yeah. just be so off? Right. So that's where with that case, it's just I look at people and I just I help them to understand. But I'm also happy to have conversations with spouses. Yeah. I send them videos. I saw. You have. I, and I'm going to put that up be, right? uh, later uh, when we. In the show notes. Yeah, because that video that you sent me and I was t telling Dr. Ryan earlier today that it's just not my kind of a video to watch, mm -hmm. you know, it's not going to be entertaining. No so Kardashians. Was like, and I was like, yeah, one. no Kardashians in there. And I was like, <laughs> no. it's two hours, but I got to do this because I'm preparing for this episode. And I was telling Dr. Ryan, it took me so long to watch it because I had to pause, write notes, pause. I had questions and it really activated a lot for me in a way that I just, I didn't have this kind of knowledge and understanding. And I guess what I'm talking about, and maybe I'd, I'll ask you to talk a little bit more about it because I won't butcher it, but we're talking about the the C1. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, you know, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what that is, but the impact this has on your nervous system. Correct. So if we can dive a little bit into, because you're saying like a neck pain, you're going up to the brain, but also that neck pain is contributing, can be contributing to a lot of internal things, mm -hmm. whether it's our mental health, whether it's our physical health. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? Because my mind was blown. Just, I just want to mention this one slide when I was watching this video and I was telling you, and the slide had all the physical and mental health concerns that many people around us would experience. IBS, gut health, Crohn's, um, migraines, um, I don't know, it, the list goes on, anxiety, depression, all these sorts of things, and they were linked to your, it's your central nervous system, right? Yeah, your upper cervical spine and your nerves, because yeah. each of those conditions has a practitioner or a way of symptomatically treating it. Right. But when you look up that algorithm, at the very top is the neurological source mm -hmm. to what's going on. Yeah, and we don't, 
like you said earlier, when our health system is for for whatever reason, wherever our health system is at, it there's no time and no room to dig into that and connect the dots. So you have, a, let's say I, I'm struggling with this pain, but now I'm seeing my medical doctor for some anxiety meds and I'm seeing my masseuse for this thing over here and I'm seeing my naturopath for that thing over there. And maybe we're not communicating not together. it's all connected. Right. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm seeing my therapist as well, but I just can't put those strategies to, to work and I'm feeling hopeless and hopeless and hopeless. And we can go down a really scary road of mm-hmm. suicide and self-harm mm-hmm. and all these things that we later don't don't even realize we're connected to the to something mm-hmm. that actually could have been fixed. Yeah. So can we talk about that? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think so, the listeners would like Carrie's story to to hear the first story? So, would... Yeah, 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 yeah. I just wanted to back up before we yeah. dove into the C1 because I think that's a, to me that's a major aha moment. And if this is okay, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You've mentioned your journey a couple times. Mm-hmm. And I don't know your journey, mm-hmm. your pain journey, and where you got there. Right, would you be willing to share yeah. that? That's a good one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's, like if that's if you're comfortable. I'm with. always happy okay. to. Absolutely. Yeah. So really, for for a lot of people growing up, you do stupid stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I still had a do. couple head trauma. Right? <laughs> I know we still do stuff, but you know, growing up, when you're younger, you don't have the strength, stability throughout your body yeah. to resist going through a trauma. Mm. So I had a couple significant head traumas as a kid, mm-hmm. one where I ended up in the hospital. Wow. And it's interesting because now when I look back at all the symptoms, I realize how everything for me physically and emotionally deteriorated from that point. Mm. It, it, was, it was pretty bad, right? And so after that, because when you realize what happens with, with the neck, how, how you know that things happen physically and emotionally, mm. because even just my well-being inside, I just always knew that I just wasn't the same after. Mm-hmm. I wasn't who I was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. I always give, give this, this funny example because one of my colleagues that I work with, I've known him for years. He was a personal trainer when I worked at a different location. And he used to tell me that I was like Eeyore. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, just... He was like, man, you were just like, always, oh, life's so good <laughs> and this and that, yeah. right? But that's just because with the effect of what was going on, I couldn't control it. Yeah. And you're just in this dark, dark, dark place Mm -hmm. of being exhausted but at a head trauma through various things like stress life you know professional school working out trying to do bodybuilding all those things it all just breaks you down Mm -hmm. and if you your body isn't resistant you actually do break down more over time it worsens and so i did and then, you know, we were out in Ontario, then we moved to Calgary, we start our chiropractic business, and we're working really hard. So stress is really high, we're having kids, mm-hmm. all those things, things just kept getting harder, mm-hmm. right? And so all of a sudden, you're not well, then I have food sensitivities because my guts are always irritated, mm-hmm. Right, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling extremely anxious, and I'm not an anxious person. Mm. I'm feeling all these things to the point where, when my when I'd come home on a Friday after my job's physical, yeah. I'd come home on a Friday mm-hmm. and I would lay on the bed, half asleep, and my kids would just bounce on me. Yeah. And I, I, but I had nothing left, so I wasn't present all the time. I had nothing at the end of the day to push beyond. And you just kind of don't have this great existence anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, I'd wake up every day in pain. Yeah. Every day. I, and you're me, working out at the time? Yes. So you're as doing the things that could. society's telling you, like, oh, work out <sighs> and eat. It's supposed to be better. Blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. I know. But that's where when you're so compromised, those things do help to manage stress. Sure. But everything else is just so much the, yeah. the scale's just tipping in terms of things are not good. Mm-hmm. Well, and I don't even know if you're being present in that time too. So you're how not. are you really putting what mentally and physically you may need to when you're working out or in your job, in mm-hmm. your relationship and all of that? And so you're just, it's like a, you were talking about like a brain fog, essentially. Mm-hmm. You're just That's sort exactly of getting yeah. through. Yeah, you are distracted, yeah. right? You are not present in the same degree. My, my ex-partner, she would always she would always look at me when we were in a group setting. Yeah. She's like, why are you being antisocial? Uh-huh. I'm, I'm like, I'm not. I thought I was present. She's like, you're not talking to me. The noise uh-huh. was too much for me. I would close in. Yeah. 
So if you could imagine every social setting I was in, I would go home from work every day and ice my hands because I would just be sore or I'd have this pain. I would wake up in the morning. I always had an upper neck pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Always. It was there for a good 10 years. Misdiagnosed, but we can talk about that. Sure. <laughs> um, so it's all those things where I was just not keeping my head even above water. I was struggling. And those are dark times when you can't be present with your kids. Yeah. You don't remember half those times. Yeah. You're antisocial. You're in pain all the time. Yeah. And that's yeah. my life. And then when people come and they see me now because I'm thriving. Yeah, I like I met a very different. I would never be able to imagine you that way because of just even the few conversations I've had or even Carrie's mm-hmm. experience with you. You have yes. this energy. Yeah. You're excited about this conversation. So I would imagine that's how you would be when your patients walk in. I, my energy is like sky so high with yeah. patience because you have to energize. You have yes, to give them course. something they're lacking. And were you having? Were you doing that? Finding a way to do that when you were in, during during yes, those dark times? That's why I'd go home exhausted. Yeah, you're I would giving give your best there. all of it. Yeah. Uh, and it's, Man, that's rough. It, it's mm-hmm. so hard. But it, and that's where when people look at it, they're like, "He's so much better. In a year, I'm going to be great." Yeah, it's not like that because it took me. Like even from the start of the process of recovery, yeah, six years to recover. Good. Like we have to look at a recovery in year increments when you're as bad as I was. Yeah. Oh. Because there's a handful of people with the same severity as I as I had, which is very hard. And and they're all surprised when I tell them, think about year increments. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, yep. They come back to me a yeah. year later. Then the two years later, they're like, I actually thought you were joking. Right. So I'm not joking. Yeah. You and know? so what, like, so say from what I had or have or had or whatever, mm-hmm. if I still have it, I don't think so, but versus what you had, mm-hmm. say I'm a, like scale to one to 10, what did I have versus what do you had? And what is it? What was the difference? Absolutely. So yours is mild, okay. right? Yes. You still have some neurological things that are going to happen, that are going to heal over the next year or two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it depends on the degree of trauma with in and the dysregulation of Mm -hmm. what's going on because everything is such in harmony in the body one thing goes you you have to get that back Mm -hmm. it doesn't just all of a sudden go hey i'm back to normal that's right right it's a process and he's your patient is part of that process Mm -hmm. right so like it also depends on it's not just a fix and you're done like carrie would have to now keep doing his rolling techniques and those sorts of things yes but it's mostly about his nervous system because okay. it only heals if it the holds. first one. Yeah. You know, it always goes back age, to that, right? right? Because yeah. your nervous system is still healing and it takes mm. so much longer than we anticipate. Yeah. Because there are so many things that happen physiologically, yeah. anatomically that's going on. And most people just underestimate it because they're used to traditional medicine that if I don't have pain, I'm good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I just did a post on my Instagram the other day and I was like, no, pain and symptoms are only halfway. Yeah. 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 You know, if you want to thrive and you want to be better. Yeah. So And on- that's just what it's about is the thrive and be better. I I and, and maybe some of this also has to do with the last few years with COVID. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people's hopes and desires to thrive and do better have been lost. And so, and I'm the part of that, like I said, is COVID, but those that are suffering and silently suffering with this chronic pain, just thinking about the ability to be where Carrie is today, you to be where you're at today to say, look, I, I'm on the path to health. I'm on the path to recovery. It's such a foreign concept. And I know I keep saying it because it, it, it just, it blows my mind to hear you talk the way you talk. And you know, this is why Carrie, I wanted you here today because you're like the evidence yeah. of, of what Dr. Ryan's talking about. However, there's going to be people listening today that are, are going to do what you did with Richard A at lunch, <laughs> which is, but I know my, my pain's different. I already did that. Or that one doctor already told me that it has to be this way. I hear way. that when I tell yeah. them about. But Dr. the doctor Ryan. told me this. So yeah, well, I need I surgery. Yeah, well, I something different. I, I get that a lot. Everybody is an expert in, in a, a, an area. You can't know everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And and that's where also say back pain is, pain is not the same as having a neck issue. Mm. Right? It's all 
emotionally and, and challenging, mm -hmm. but up here, there's just so much more of the effect on the brain. So yeah. that's where no matter what pain is relevant and it can be exhausting and challenging, um, but we don't have to struggle. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. your, your neck, um, I guess your misdiagnosed neck issue mm -hmm. ended up being, so what, what, what versus so, like, say what I had, I had a mild one, mild, you had a yeah. major one or a, about as severe as you can get. Yeah. But that's because when it comes down to the body breaking down, you mm. have to look at many variables. Okay. Right? When we talk about the neck and say other spots in the body, mm. but mostly the neck, we have mm. to look at genetics. Mm. We look have to look at stress. Mm -hmm. Stress is the number one cause of people coming back to me right now with recurrences because mm. no matter what they've done as an intervention, if you are grieving mm. with things oh, going yeah. on, you can't. You will just, you can't. You become a bit unresponsive Sure. in that state. And yeah. trauma is the last one. Yeah. So genetic stress and trauma, you have to account for those variables. Because I see people that have sprained an ankle, dislocated a shoulder, and it's back in and they think, I'm fine. Yeah. I'm like, you're not fine. <laughs> those things that hold those joints together will never go back to the same when you've caused a certain level of trauma. Mm -hmm. There is now a residual laxity of those ligaments that stabilize the joints. Mm -hmm. Because why is it that people ever have arthritis in the neck and shoulders if they're not weight-bearing joints in terms of we don't walk on them every day? Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is wear and tear. And if you have stability around that joint, the wear and tear of that area yeah. is significantly less. Mm. But you can start to predetermine that. Mm -hmm. mm. So yeah, so for me, I have genetic laxity, which is why both of my daughters have to get the same care okay. of adjustments and prolotherapy that, that we have to do to fix this. Okay. Yeah. I've gone through just, you know, stressful life. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And I've had head trauma. Right. So like it's check the, all the boxes. perfect storm yeah. to getting me into that place where there was no solutions back then. Mm -hmm. And so I just struggled. But when we talk about the neck, especially if we talk about like the upper cervical, the C1 issue, mm -hmm. it's a neurological degenerative condition. It means you will deteriorate. Okay. Yeah, okay? I felt like I was going that route. You will break down. Nerves will break down more as you go. Yeah. And that's where with the video that you watch, there's more videos yeah. that demonstrate the impact of all of that. Right. That's yeah. why it's important where, you know, people will think, oh, I can live with this or I can do this. Well, it's not about staying where you are. Mm -hmm. You are going to regress. You will get worse. Well, yeah. How far do you want to take that when you can start healing now? So for, so for people that are like, okay, well, I want to start healing now. Mm -hmm. And how, what would you suggest? Like, where's the place to start? And we're talking about our neck. Mm -hmm. And so what, what is, is that kind of all you're saying? Or are you saying in general, like, where's, where's the place people can start to bring? Education is where most people need to start. Yeah. Is because if you walk through an airport, yes, what's everybody doing? Looking down. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes. The devices. Everybody is yeah. looking down. And when you look at the evidence, the weight of the head relative to the neck when they are flexed or bent that much is yeah. harmful. Yeah. And because of the weight of the head pulling forward, it is pulling everything with it. And it is actually increasing laxity of the ligaments that hold wow. your C1 on your C2 vertebrae. Yeah which is the most unstable joint in the body, more unstable than your, your shoulder, right? Mm. Yeah. Which dislocates. So, like, so you're putting a weight on that yeah. and hanging on it every day. And then we're all of a sudden surprised. It's like, oh, wow, where'd that come from? Yeah. It's been building. Well, and that makes me think of kids mm -hmm. because we are in such a world of electronic devices and everything yeah. small. And so kids are constantly... I mean, we are too, but kids are constantly looking down that way. So, yeah, like I started looking down when I was 30, for instance, or yeah, 28 right. or whatever, mm -hmm. like when phones finally had screens that you'd want to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now kids are... Way younger. What? Four, eight? three, two, five, depends. What we see here. Yeah, but right? But when they are not strong in those areas or developed to have the stiff, all those things, the ligaments that mm -hmm. hold the joints actually in place. Always remember nerve muscles, ligaments, joints. If yeah. those ligaments have to truly protect those joints, mm -hmm. like we are creating laxity in a future of 
not good things because yeah. when yeah. you're in that position, you are actually tensioning the spinal cord. You are putting load and, and irritation through the upper cervical spine, mm -hmm. which is upper spinal cord and the brain stem. Right. It's, it's not good. So what does that do when that happens over time? Like what deteriorates Yeah. and gives you symptoms. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll always say it's not always pain, especially if we're going to talk, you know, about emotional stuff in the upper cervical spine. Uh, you know, I, and, and I'll never say C1 fixes everything. I always want to be clear that doing and restoring things doesn't mean it necessarily fixes everything yeah. because there can be different roots of things. So one topic that's really big is adrenal fatigue. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I went through that for years yeah. because it's a diagnosis. Right. But guess so what that what, diagnosis is? What Secondary. Is, what is adrenal fatigue? fatigue? So your adrenal glands on okay. top of your kidneys okay. produce a significant number of hormones in your body. Mm. Okay. And this is where we get into trouble. When you're in chronic stress, you deplete these. Your vitality goes down. It's a significant condition that is now quite a hype. But for me, it's just a symptom secondary to an upper cervical right. problem. Yeah. Mm. See, because, you know, your yeah. listeners, everybody will hear about adrenal fatigue and say, I've got that. Yeah. I've got that. My naturopath gives me supplements for that. This, 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 this. But I always look at people and I say, why? Why are why? you, why do you need why that do you supplement? Have that? Why do you have that? Why do you need that? Why this, why, 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 why do you have knee pain? Why do you have back pain? Why do you have neck pain? Why do you have a headache? Mm -hmm. If you don't know why you're not fixing anything, you're relieving it or managing it. Yeah. And so we have to look and say why, because there's many forms of adrenal fatigue. So there's a spectrum of adrenal fatigue because it's very important because this is where people say, I'm exhausted. Yes. I have adrenal fatigue, Right. But that's right. still a symptom mm -hmm. of your upper cervical area, Yeah. right? But then there can be chemical adrenal fatigue. There can be functional adrenal fatigue, structural, okay, so emotional yes. PTSD yeah. can cause a heightened event. But what I'm saying is there's always a different version. If you don't find the source or the reason of that, then you're going to be in trouble because yeah. how can you ever fix it? Yeah. But you need your adrenals because... You know, how many people go through around our age of my hormones are off. Mm. I have 100%. hair loss. I yes. don't feel good. My vitality is down. Yeah. My sex drive is down. Yeah. Yeah. But then you stop looking at the why and it's just like, hey, we'll just do hormone replacement therapy and you're fine. Yeah. Well, no, there's like a list of like 10 things that I could think of that you could do naturally to help hormones. And then if that doesn't work, of course, sure. complement it. Yeah. But it doesn't mean just top up whatever you need but that's what we do in this culture we, we we do top up so when when you're exactly what you're saying if i go to the naturopath and i'm getting these supplements sometimes our mentality is i'm doing it because it'll prevent something or i'll just add you know i'll start taking collagen i'll start doing these sorts of things because it's going to prevent it from getting worse it's going to make it better and so we, we we always you know the whole looking young culture we're in so we take these supplements we do these things and I think we have the same, many of us have the similar mindset when it's with our physical pain or our mental health as well as, well, I'll just stay on these meds or I'll take these things over here to help me without getting to the bottom of, but why do I need them? Mm -hmm. Where's that coming from? And we, we, we always want to go big, you know, so I'll just take extra stuff. I'll just, do. I'll do all these things. And sometimes they are complimented. So say someone will come to me and say, oh, my naturopath has taken me th through a liver cleanse. Awesome cleansing it's good yeah right but what happens is is and maybe we can get into it now is yeah. the true effects of the upper cervical spine yes yeah. impair that so the first question is are you responsive to anything you're going to do i look at patients when they come in mm -hmm. and i'm like but were you ever responsive i know you're frustrated because this and chiro and acupuncture and massage didn't work for you mm -hmm. but did anybody ever look and say you were unresponsive to that in the first place and you were never going to get better because i can tell you <laughs> by assessing you that was not the case so you were never going to get better you were misled and you had this false assumption and so i look at them and regardless if you are neurologically right? Yeah. Not feeding that liver properly in its function. Are you responsive to that cleanse? Are you going to struggle with it? Are you going to get the most out of it? Right. right. Same thing for a massage. Are you ready for that massage? Are you going to get the most out of it? Because yeah. people only have such limited benefits. My job is to make people responsive. They get the most out of it. So the one thing I'll always tell people is 
I may not be able to fix everything mm -hmm. because you could have a chemical reason for your anxiety. Mm -hmm. I can't, but the upper cervical spine is an amplifier. So it, it, it's like putting an igniter on a fire. It makes it worse. So at least we can downgrade the severity to a better level, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Make life better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Well, I, well, the way, what I hear you being in the mental health field, what I hear you saying similar, probably what a therapist or psychiatrist would do is say, okay, you're diagnosed with, let's say anxiety, mm -hmm. you're going to therapy and maybe the therapy, the strategies are really hard for you to, to utilize, to follow through. Uh, and you see these with a lot of people that are diagnosed with ADHD, mm -hmm. the impulsivity, it's just, it's, it's too much to be able to stop and think and do whatever it is that they need to do. Mm -hmm. So let's take some meds, help manage some of that. So now you can better learn those strategies and you totally. can get better and maybe you won't need the meds anymore and yeah. may maybe they will help, but it's more than, there's a, there's more than just taking this supplement or doing this thing. You, you have to do other things to go alongside. It's multidimensional. Yeah. And I'll use my daughter for an example. Sure. Because my daughter has the same upper cervical instability that I have in laxity. So she gets symptoms. And it, it's just amazing to see the impact firsthand. Because there's days where if something happened, because she has lots of stress, she's a teenager, all, and she mm -hmm. has laxity and, and all those things. Right. So there's times where if she was symptomatic and things would happen, she would lay on the couch lethargic mm -hmm. with a white face. I can't move. I just can't move. I just, I just don't have it in me. Mm -hmm. I would treat her. Mm -hmm. Within an hour to an hour and a half, she'd be outside playing, which was good. Wow. And so it, for her, because that's how it was affecting her to that degree – but it didn't take away her anxiety. And that's the thing. I'm not yeah. saying I can fix it, but yeah. I can relieve it. Yes. So that when she was going through her worst year last year, mm -hmm. I made sure that we kept her neck well. And then when that wasn't enough, then she did have to go on medication. Right. Yeah. And it was only for me, the combination of the two yeah. that made her able to use those coping mechanisms yeah. wasn't the one thing. Right. Would the meds have helped on their own? They would have helped. Yeah. Yeah. But if she was also dealing with this emotional heightened nature because of her neurological system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. it just would have been harder. Why make it yeah. harder? Why? Well, that's just it. And so when we talk about that from the neurological perspective, what part of the brain are we, do you, I don't know if you know, like what part mm -hmm. of the brain are we accessing when we are experiencing anxiety and then, or when we're experiencing that physical pain? Like, is it the same part of the brain or are that, there? That's pretty loaded because with anxiety, we have to look all the way to the gut. Yeah. Right. So I'll talk on the brain in terms okay. of when we deal with say upper cervical issues, yeah. it inhibits the frontal lobe. And the frontal okay. lobe is the pretext. So that's our yeah. planned, our critical thinking, all that, right? And some behavior and, and mood. Some, okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's where kids, where they can just be like, ah, and, and just go into a, a thing, a tizzy, and not right. have that ability to control yeah. it comes that, from that, what's that, controlled. It's like teenagers with impulse. They, right? That part of the brain hasn't been developed is what I'm Absolutely. hearing. Absolutely. Right. Okay. But if you inhibit it or impair it, yeah. from the neurological connections, you can still get a similar thing where it's just like you shut off, you can't control it, it's, yeah. it's so much. Right. Because when we talk about your nervous system, it, it's, it's a two-lane road. It okay. goes up and down, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not just yeah. brain down, well, everything comes back. So it's the circulation. Yeah, it's like electricity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when the C1's at the very top, the, the very top vertebrae under the skull, everything passes through there up and down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sorry, can I just mm -hmm. uh, interject? Can we, or sorry, can you, mm -hmm. for me even, explain the upper cervical spine, or like the numbers and all that, and like, mm -hmm. and how that would look if I was going to visualize it? Just so like, yeah, maybe I don't know if you know what it looks what like. What is the C one? Like, kind of like what what's the, what is the impact to it to the nervous system? Is that sort of what you're asking? Like, yeah, what is just this? like so yeah. the C one is the very top bone in your spine. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. and then so and then that would have a nerve bundle, or in the middle of that, or how does that work? Okay, isn't there the vague the vagus so one? You, I, I we watch, will get. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was watching my so video. So at the my very homework. top is the skull. Okay, underneath that is your neck, which is your cervical spine. Yeah. And what happens is it curves forward. It's called a lordosis. You have seven cervical vertebrae. 
Okay. okay. Now, for the most part, all the vertebrae in your body, whether you go through your cervical spine, which is seven, thoracic spine, 12, and then lumbar spine, five, and we go from there. Um, the neck at the very top is very different because it's very unstable because we have to move our head around. Sure. So we need mobility right. as hunter gatherers to be looking and, and all these things. So when you lack stability, you add mobility, but it's compromised. Okay. Through that, at the top of it, right, right, just above the C1, but still influenced in there, we have what's called the brain stem. That's the segment down from the brain that has what we call some, some nerves called your cranial nerves. That's all the stuff about your face and mm. eyes and tongue and that sort of stuff. Then from there has just your, your spinal cord coming down from your brain, which goes through your cervical spine. Okay. So we're talking about an influence right above it of the brain stem but mostly the spinal cord mm -hmm. and everything passes through there. What's what, and again, I'm not an expert on brain, but from the little bit that I understand, like the back of my brain is where I also experience my trauma, my fight, flight, or freeze, a lot of those emotions. And it's very closely connected from the way you talk mm -hmm. to the beginning of my, you know, the C1 and going into my, mm -hmm. down to my vertebrae. So when you, t when you mentioned your daughter and her anxiety and those kinds of things, you, you think, holy, holy we're, we're sort of opening the door to talking a lot or understanding how our brain and our mental health, our well-being, our emotions, all those things are connected to that part. That, that, that's probably why we call it the central nervous system, mm -hmm. I would imagine, because it's totally. the beginning. So it's like where your brain connects to the rest of you. Brain and body. Yeah. It, right. And so we, we, talk, we talk a lot, right? We, we teach kids mind, brain, body, but I don't think we talk enough about the space. But like, what does that actually mean? That's how close it's connected. Mm -hmm. Your irritability, all those kind. no wonder you're experiencing... So, so that's sort of how your symptoms are coming out mm -hmm. with the, your feelings or your mental health struggles. And then here we are starting with also, how do I fix this? There's, there's more than one fix, I guess, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's very closely connected. Absolutely. It's crazy. Like that's, you don't really think about that though. Yeah. And that's why I, I just, you know, I mentioned before, I work underneath a psychology office. Yeah. Yeah. And there's tough things going on there. Yeah. And I don't see any be. patients from there, yeah. even though I've made people aware of what I do. Yeah. And so I find that challenging because if there's a, somebody sitting in front of you when you're speaking and, and they're going through a time and they're like, I can't cope. Yeah. I can't do life. I can't do this. Like, it's yeah. like, what are you going to suggest to this person to help make life more doable? Oh, mm -hmm. totally. Like we've right? seen so many clients over the years when I was working uh, young people, adolescents that also experience some sort of trauma, playing football, uh, getting some sort of neck injury, and, and maybe not even just neck, other parts of their body as well. And you hear so many times parents were like, and it's very similar to what you were saying, this was a different, my kid, my, my kid changed. Mm -hmm. This isn't my kid anymore. I, I, this is a monster before me yeah, because, or my husband or my wife or uh, whatever. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And, and, and I was getting worried that that's where you were headed, Carrie, oh, because we're sure. like, this is not, this isn't the happy go lucky. And that's what we're feeling. Imagine what you are. But when you're, like you said, when you're so, you're so stuck in that and you're trying to figure out what, how to manage the pain, when's my next dose of meds, it, it very, it is very difficult to connect. You think it's yeah. brain down. You don't think there can be a parent in yeah. there. And the other thing that I tell people with any trauma like that is that concussion and cervical spine have an overlap. Mm -hmm. And just everybody will say, I had a concussion and these are my symptoms. I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, those half of those are cervical related, Yeah. right? Half of them. Mm -hmm. And so I will tell people that, yes, if you have a concussion, you automatically have whiplash and you, so you will have a C1 right. syndrome with that. But sometimes... Some of those symptoms can yeah. just be 20% of it and 80% come from the neck, which means it's treatable and sometimes vice versa. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, why would yeah. you not want to do as much as you can conservatively mm -hmm. as soon as possible mm -hmm. and try to help it out? Because you don't know. Yeah, because right? we look at things traditionally. Yeah. It's just that, oh, I have a concussion. I have to sit in a dark room and do this, this. But the evidence on concussion changes all the time. Right. And we don't think about doing the next stuff yeah. of yeah. which you can relieve symptoms significantly. So I've had people come from very bad traumas in the past of symptoms that are lingering. They've done all the brain stuff. Mm -hmm. I treat them and guess what happens? They get better. Mm -hmm. 
because you have to see the big picture. Yeah, you do. You do. You're right. And I feel like you said at the beginning with our healthcare system, often we, we hone in on one thing, we isolate things and we don't really look at it from a bird's eye view of, oh, all these things are actually could be connected. Yes. But again, that's because they treat symptomatically, yes. not systematically. Yeah. And that's the difference. If yeah. you're treating as a system, you're going to look at the unit. Yes. Instead yeah. of just what is your symptom, and that right. is like therapy. That's a that's you just describe what family systems therapy is exactly. Mm-hmm. You have a young person who is acting out behaviorally, and a lot of times parents want that fix. And our conversation is that that behavior is a symptom of something that's disrupted in this home. Mm-hmm. There's something else going, and there's right. all sorts of things that might be happening in a home: move, stress, COVID, divorce, all sorts of things. And and when we when we just try to isolate the behavior. And, you know, we know how that works when you're treating behavior. You're, not, you're, you know, you're only going to get your kid to follow the gold star chart for so long as humans that we're not motivated by behavioral consequences. And yet that's sort of where we go and we teach. And so when, when you talk about your neck and all this sort of stuff, I'm like, oh my God, your world and a lot of my colleagues, therapist world is very similar. Yeah. Being but, attuned to where's the problem. Totally. But you know what's funny? Because, you know, sometimes we talk about the, the chiro versus physio thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Typically, we're doing the same thing. Yeah. It if you're verse. good, yeah. if you're good, you're, you're trying to do the same thing. Of yeah. course. And it's, and for me, it's a never, it's never a them versus us or anything. It's a, what is that person doing? Yeah. I don't care what their profession is. Mm. What are they doing to help you? Right. Because a physio can do exactly what I do. Right. And yeah. when I teach, because I'm going to be eventually teaching what I do, yeah. it's going to be open to massage therapists, to sure. physios. Anybody that can do manual therapy yeah. needs to have an awareness of how to treat. It's not about a profession anymore. Yeah. It's about the patient and being restorative to their overall well-being. Mm-hmm. We've got to stop chasing symptoms. And that's why I said mm-hmm. that's where my middle finger goes up to <laughs> that old mm-hmm. school stuff that people are still living in the 90s with their treatment yeah. styles. Yeah. I'm like, get updated. Yeah. Be better. <laughs> so right? can I can I yeah. actually follow that up with a question? So in school, mm-hmm. like chiropractic school, how do they teach you to treat a C1 or how do they teach you to adjust a C1? They don't. That's it. Okay, sorry. Whoa. They don't. But what? No. <laughs> I know. You would think that's the craziest thing, right? So there is a division within chiropractic because they teach various methods. Oh, because I do active release techniques, right? Yeah. In my clinic, I do a variety of various things, but we learn it outside of school. School teaches a framework. Sure. And that's it. And they teach it all how to diagnose various conditions and do all that. And they teach you how to do standard adjustments. Mm -hmm. But the me learning to do what I do has completely been my own evolution. That's why when, when people say, Oh, I'm going back to Toronto, who can you refer me to? Nobody, nobody does what I do because it's my own thing. And I have taken pieces of everything else that I've learned. Or if they are doing it, it could be their, they, it was their trip or their journey to get where they are. And it's not like they would be, advertising it necessarily most people do yeah they, they do okay it's just this is where i'm saying they stay in the box and don't get me wrong i'm not maybe not the only one but the one that has maybe put together the c1 and the instability sure highly likely because you don't see many people with a with the exact true complete understanding of how we do it right so seamlessly like when my neck was adjusted prior mm-hmm. and i was waiting for when i went to see mm-hmm. you it was like okay cradle cradle to the side, snap, yep. cradle, cradle, to the side, snap, right? So I'm assuming you were taught that one. Of course. And we so what, is, what does that do ones. versus what? Well, it's, it's the wrong direction. Yeah. So everything has a direction mm-hmm. or a vector that you want to go. And based on the anatomy, the only way that a C1 can get misaligned or shift is forward. Mm. The What's compression. this? Watch this. If I'm adjusting i am going forward forward Hmm. with rotation yeah but i'm pushing forward Mm -hmm. so before i got my neck treated i used to get adjusted as well every time my little pinky would zing with a nerve right yeah yeah i'd be like oh that was weird that zinged me i'm like that doesn't feel right yeah Hmm. so i'm going and i thought the opposite like oh it's good that my my everything's flowing now totally no it is in the wrong direction you're zinging a nerve because you're irritating it Mm. and 
if there is any laxity in those ligaments, you are accelerating the laxity yeah. of those ligaments what is that, that again? hold it. The laxity, what is that again? So when ligaments have lost their integrity, right? Because well, there's a level of stiffness to a ligament. If and ligaments it, are what, they are what hold like the bones, bones right? Bones. They're like yes. the glue is what the video was saying to hold the bl- or the bones. Yes. Okay. So those are what hold bones together to truly stabilize a joint. Right. Right. Yeah. And so if over time wear and tear, I equate ligaments like bridges, overuse, they will break down in their structural integrity. Mm-hmm. Right. And so if that happens, how do you repair a bridge? Well, you can get an engineer, you can go in and repair and do all that stuff. Yeah. How do you restore a stre- an overstretched, a traumatized, a lax ligament? I exactly. Know. Mm, yeah. Nobody knows. <laughs> it's a strict question. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, it is to most people traditionally, but that's where prolotherapy comes in. Right. Okay, yeah. That's and, why we use it in conjunction, that? because if I position a joint and the ligaments are just too loose to hold that joint yeah. to get the symptomatic sustainability because mm-hmm. it only heals if it holds. Then you can do injection therapy because mm-hmm. it's regenerative therapy. Mm-hmm. It's an injection therapy where you inject dextrose, with, which is a sugar solution, bathe the ligaments, and it actually regrows connective tissue inside of it to tighten it up. Yeah. And Regenerative that was, medicine. That was rich as neat. Because he mm. was supposed to go get a surgery, right? That oh, was yeah. like right before surgery that he discovered or somehow came across you. So, and you did prolotherapy, Carrie. Yep. Yeah. So, what, what, what do you, can you tell us? Can both of you tell us a little bit about that? I don't know. What well, I mean, I don't know it. the background of it. I know the physical part totally. of it. Yeah. So, the reason is because at the beginning, the diagnosis was a C1 syndrome. It means that the C1 was out of alignment and influencing negatively on the nerve structures in the area. Everybody has an array of symptoms. So that's why we call it a syndrome. Mm. We define that because of the muscle or motor function loss as a result of the testing, right? If you don't test, you guess. Mm. It was the lack of sustainability that allows us to define, is it just a C1 that's out of alignment or a C1 that's unstable? Right. And so if it's unstable, we know the ligaments do not have the integrity because of trauma, stress, Mm -hmm. various things to hold. So then we need to apply an injection therapy to tighten up those ligaments to sustain it. So keeping in mind when you ask me about chiropractic, which is great when it's needed, but you shouldn't need it as much as we think. Mm -hmm. And it should hold. We're in this thing where people always come in like, once I'm adjusted, do I have to be adjusted forever? Yeah. I've heard that quizzically like I I, I know you've heard that because everybody just keeps going but Mm -hmm. sometimes we are making things worse because most people don't evaluate do you have instability is that even on your radar and if it's not it's my job to educate and that's fair and I will Mm -hmm. Um, but at this point most people don't know like if, if there's somebody going in to treat and do a joint or do something are they asking are they responsive yeah are they asking do they have any laxity or instability? Can they hold my adjustment? And yeah. how am I going to evaluate and assess if that's even the case? Right. Yeah. yeah. And if it's not, for me, I think that's pretty unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because you can make their condition worse and accelerate it. So can you tell us a little bit about how would I, or how did Carrie come to a place where he needed, and you, he, the plan was to get prolotherapy. So well, how the plan did you... was, at the beginning, it wasn't, I mean, we discussed it mm-hmm. and I knew that's what Rich had got. Right. And, and now that I know what I know, I probably would have just started with it. Cause you also asked your family doctor if you should do it. You asked advice from your doctor and your doctor, what did your doctor say? Uh... They were like, you shouldn't. Well, A, that won't be my family doctor anymore. Okay. <laughs> I seen yes, him once and I'm like, you no, I'm not a fan. I know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I can't remember. He didn't. It was. It was nothing negative or or, oh, okay. or positive. I don't. Yeah. It was. It wasn't anything that resonated. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. But yet you still chose to. Because I remember when when before Disney when you messed it up more, mm. you were also diagnosed with some other physical health stuff too. So yeah, it's like that's the right. gut. Yeah. Stuff, my gut which stuff, is yeah. interesting because that was like your your pain was at its worst too. Yeah. At well, that time. you know, anytime you have something wrong with you and you don't know what it is. Mm-hmm between you know going to the doctor doing all the blood tests and finding out what it is it's cancer it's everything in your head you know what i mean like so i was freaked out so i'm like no i'm gonna go get all this done especially after watching the video and Mm -hmm. the link between 
the head and the gut and mm-hmm. whatever yeah. it was, right? So that was my tipping point there. Yeah. But knowing what I know now, I sh- I could have or should have just got it done yeah. because there wouldn't have been any harm to it. No. But that's no. not, I don't, that's not what, like, so why would people think there is harm to it? Why did you think that? Like, what, did I don't you know. look Google, it up? Or, Google yeah, anything yeah, yeah. and there's like the camp of the, oh my yeah. God, this is ridiculous. So the or camp, this whatever. Is the best thing ever, yeah. And anytime I heard in the past or thought of natural path, anything, I'm like, oh, fake medicine. Mm. Right? Totally. And you Western you, you, med people, hey? Yeah. yeah. But you get <laughs> such bad things, especially when you yes. look online because people come to me yes. that I know will truly benefit from what we do between the chiropractic and the prolo. And they look online and they were like, well, I saw it doesn't work for some people. Yeah. I'm like, you'll Google that for everything. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I'll tell you, there's a, a lot of variables that go into it because number one, did that person that got the prolo elsewhere get assessed for responsiveness? Right. You know what I mean? See yeah. how this goes down? Did they have a functional assessment? Do you know why we have a hundred a hundred percent success rate with prolo? Because they're functional going into it. They you have a proper right. diagnosis. Right. They are responsive. Mm. They are functional. Mm-hmm. They are set up for the right reason. Yeah. And we have one hundred percent success rate with prolo. What does that mean? Does it mean that we can fix and cure everything one hundred percent? That's not the that's not the goal. Yeah. Right. The goal is to be their best. Yeah. And if it's the best and can make them function, I have stories upon stories of everything that I've seen. But ultimately, if somebody that can yeah. go from being on, you know, WCB injured, like in a really bad place yeah. to now wanting to climb every big mountain in Alberta. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's, that, cool. Right? that's a story. That's crazy. Oh yeah. That's just one of many along wow. that. I can, my, my receptionist could tell you so many stories cause she sees the face of everybody coming in. Yeah. yeah. Changes color. The pre and post measure. Oh yeah. yeah. The face, the face, like it's the, the drawn face, the yeah. fatigued, the white look yeah. on their mm-hmm. face. Uh, the personality changes. I, I can tell you, I have a couple select people who would just come out of a room and yell at everybody but for being so loud because their hypersensitivity was so heightened right guess what they don't do now they don't do it they come in with a smile they joke they do all those things and it's their entry into the space and their energy yeah that has completely shifted so when i say yeah i was your before i was yeah. i was super negative i was just withdrawn I was, but i've seen it with patients yeah. and this is where i tell you with the patients with significant trauma that are severe yeah. And you go by the year increments. Right. They come in a new person. Right. Mm. Like they get a new lease on life. You know, I know it's kind of cheesy when it's like, mm-hmm. oh, you totally changed my life and all that stuff. But for some people, mm-hmm. I look at them and I'm like, yeah, I really did mm-hmm. change that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's cool. Well, it's, yeah. And they're telling you that. And mm-hmm. and their quality of life, they're telling you what their quality of life is either back to or at a place where they probably didn't think would ever be there. Mm-hmm. Like I see that with you, Carrie, all the time now where – the the person that I met 22 years ago with the funny jokes and just even the patience is back, you know, and get, get your kids ready getting for there, school. Oh yes. gosh. But that's where but, there is but, that time of recovery, but yeah, right, for sure. Right. Yeah. The difference and what I, I myself have seen than maybe what you're feeling, but getting kids ready for school is always like a perfect measure on how well you parent, you know, cause 100%. your kids are just, it's like going to Ikea with your partner. If you can survive an Ikea, then you can, and you can survive getting kids, kids ready school, for school. Yeah. You're okay. It's rough. And seeing how patient you are in the mornings, uh, in comparison to where you were when you were, I would say at your worst, it's like, Oh, we're kind of co-parenting again. We're doing mm. this together. Right. And so I, I think sometimes maybe, I don't even know for yourself, but I think for, for folks, yeah, recognizing what that quality of life can be. If you were to describe in one word as a pre-measure what your patients present or look like, what word would that be when they first come to you? Tired. How, tired. Yeah. yeah. Just their face. I can see it. They just look at me and they're just done. They're done. Yeah. 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 Well, it's sad because they, they probably went through a multitude of other avenues oh, until yeah. the rich or the me yeah. says, hey, yeah, just yeah. go try this guy out. Yeah, yeah, it's another guy. Totally. Just try him out, right? Well, because I just <laughs> yeah. had a new patient the other day. A woman comes in. She just moved her daughter in from down the street. She's from Nova Scotia. Mm-hmm. Right? So she's like, oh, I found you. I hurt my shoulder with moving mm-hmm. and my neck and my shoulder hurts. Well, with because we, you talk, you have to do a history and a physical exam. Yeah. Well, then, well, now there's this symptom 
and mm. this symptom and this symptom and this symptom because I have an intake and I'm like, so where, what's all with all these? Well, she was a nurse and with life of uh, stress, trauma, those sorts of things, it reveals that she's just putting on a front. She breaks down crying. She's mm. like, I just tell everybody I'm okay, but I'm not. Oh yeah. And guess what she had? A C1 syndrome. Wow. Right. And so she's getting all standard care back home and she had no idea. And she's a perfect exa- example mm-hmm. of what's happening. And in, as soon as I treated her, she was like, I felt completely different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's like, not all my pain's gone. Cause I tell people, I can't just take away your pain, yeah. mm-hmm. but your recovery can begin. And it's even just knowing what's going on with you because most people come in and say, I think I'm crazy. Yes. I say most people with yeah. C1 issues that are going, they're like, I think I'm nuts or I think something's wrong with me. Yeah. And so I give them reassurance and I'm like, no, no, you have this condition and yeah. everything makes sense. When they watch that video, they're like, you know, I don't feel as lost anymore mm-hmm. because most people that are deep in this, mm-hmm. right, are lost. They're yeah. like, I don't know what to do. I'm just struggling. I'm just getting through life. Yeah. And, and so much has happened. And just imagine what that does for their... Their mental health, like oh. you, you, you hear stories of people that go the, to the go down the path of suicide, mm-hmm. and you work backwards from there. And often, underlying cause is some kind of chronic pain, mm-hmm. and you know it's like the pills aren't working anymore, and all those things aren't working. And meanwhile, all along, <laughs> there could have been a find or something. But that that line in the sand that I was talking about earlier, once people cross that, um, in my experience of family members and friends that are maybe living with chronic pain, uh, like neck pain or migraines and neural stuff. It's like once they cross the line, you can't, you can't get them back because they're like, this is, that's, they're like the, the darkest version of the Eeyore that you're talking about, right? It's like negative Nancy for everything. And that, that, um, that wall you build between you and like you said, your children, your work, your family members, yourself, and this lack of uh, awareness or maybe even acceptance that there is something that we can do to fix. And so how sad is it that, you know, people go to a place of, well, I must be crazy. Yeah, they do. But the thing is, is when you actually make them better, like not make them believe they're better. Mm. It's like, I just feel better. And yeah. it's just the craziest thing. I, I, I've had an array of, of experiences because I've had people forced out of that because they're like, they're trying to hold on to that, yeah. but they're better. And they're like, but I'm better and I don't know what to do. Yeah. And I've had people stop care because they didn't know how to cope with being better. Sure. Okay. That's an interesting thing. Let's talk about that. So I had one patient. Now she does have mental health issues. So I, I have encouraged her to speak with somebody and that sort of thing. But she was so... In her life, because I think dad takes care of this, friends take care of this, family takes care mm. of this, that because I have this thing. And all of a sudden, it started to just go away. Yeah. And she was like, I can't live without this. I don't know who I am. Stopped. That was like her feeling of importance. Yep. Yeah. Well, it was yeah. her identification. Right. Yes. And yeah. now she just, that was her every day. Every day was related to dealing That's with right. this feeling. Yeah. And yeah. so sometimes you can pull people out of the darkest places and some people are not ready to come out that's right right like you take people out of like war or something because it's all very closely related in our own personal experience right and then you take them out and they don't know how to survive yeah right and it's Mm -hmm. like they go to this calm house with this calm life and it's like i need this yep thing Mm -hmm. well it's like grieving a loss but it's almost like the opposite of it in some ways because it's it would be like living a very well-rounded life. You, you you live in this massively great whatever life and then something terrible like a death or something tragic happens and you don't know how to cope. A very important person in your life has been taken away and you had no idea this was going to happen and now you're dealing with it. And so when you flip it the opposite, when something terrible is what you've lived with and now you add the hope or you put something productive or positive in there in the place, that's that's just a shocking because all I've known is how to like as you said, my identify. I've lived my life this way and I wouldn't know any other way. Plus it's never going to happen. <laughs> I have to live this way. Mm-hmm. The, and so for some people, I would imagine and we we see it in mental health too, when things are getting better, there's a relapse. Because yeah. you, you, it's like the false sense of hope or false sense of security. So all sorts of reasons why you have a relapse. It's like every movie you watch, as soon as something's really good, something bad. That's gonna, when the bad thing happens, that's right. and that starts the story. Yeah, yeah. So I like every time life is going well, I'm getting back in my head. Okay, what's that? What's that next? Oh. 
what's that next climax that's going to happen or that next measure the bad that's going to push yeah. the story along. Now and you it, manifested it, right? It is so hard bad. because you have to consider where you started from because the yeah. more severe you do have to expect peaks and valleys. You not necessarily because you had a mild case. Yeah. Yeah. As annoying as it is, it was still a mild case and your own personal experience. But well, some the pain people... I had wasn't mild, so either I'm a huge pussy. No, <laughs> no, no your condition was mild. <laughs> no, I So your cervical, <laughs> your symptoms yeah. can be a lot, Yeah, yeah. but yeah. The, the condition itself... To get it back. To get it back. Yeah. The severity of the underlying mechanism, because the worse it is, the longer it takes to heal. So I have a couple questions. Okay. Um, I just want to bring up one thing before yeah, we yeah, go. Ahead. Talking about all that stuff and the effect on the adrenals, because that's where we can have PTSD. Because the adrenal fatigue is very important to resonate for a lot of people because it's such a hype condition now. Mm -hmm. But remember that adrenals produce the cortisol. Cortisol, yeah. Cortisol that uh, that circulates in our body fights inflammation, but excessive excessive circulating cortisol mm -hmm. is destructive to our body. It creates the laxity in our ligaments. It creates. It, it can be catabolic to muscle tissue. Yeah. It sleep it. It, nice it does. Sleep it dysregulates it. our insulin response. Like all this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's why chronic stress is is terrible. But that's why helping those adrenals and helping this whole circuitry of everything is super important in every aspect because mm -hmm. with the stuff if you want to get better from pain you have to fight inflammation if your adrenals are depleted on the spectrum and you're right. not producing enough cortisol or your re your rhythms are dysregulated you're at a tough place yeah, yeah. so that's yeah. interesting so you're talking so for instance this individual who came in you've got them to a place physically where they're good. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of, and this is just me throwing it out there, have you ever thought of like partnering up or, or, you know, bringing in a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or something to kind of round out the therapy, like round out and maybe if you find that, or at least partner up with somebody? Not, I haven't thought about partnering. Yeah. I do recommend it for most or people. Or recommending it. I do, yeah, a okay. lot. For most people, if I find that, that they need coping mechanisms, it's mm -hmm. the first place I'll go. Yeah, because this is a total mind-body thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to work through those stresses and that, it's there. It's it's just such an array of things I do try to recommend because it's only, yeah. it's hard for me to say so many things mm -hmm. without keeping them on, on the same page with me in what I do. Yeah. yeah. Number one, even just getting them hydrated. Because uh -huh. when you are yeah. stressed, there's a, there's a hormone that your adrenals gets affected on that retains sodium in your body. And if it doesn't, you lose it. So then you're actually then not truly hydrated. And that's as simple as one hormone of the many affected. So I have to start then talking about just hydrate. Yeah. Eat food. Right? The right like, food. Pace yourself. Yeah. Dude, like there's the conversations depending on the severity. Yeah. There's three more hours quite of this. Long, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we so do need to do like a diet. Stress depletes yeah. magnesium. Right. Magnesium is a precursor for any vitamin D supplement mm. to work, and we need to. Do you ah, see where this goes? I sure. do. Yeah. And yeah. so stress and cortisol is critical in terms of yeah. management, coping, all these things, and you have to have these conversations. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's simply because you have people take it. Oh, I take vitamin D and vitamin C. I drink water. I'm like, you missed the most two important things, which was salt and magnesium. Yeah. Mm. Right. So it's like, it's lots of conversations are had. Sure. Well, yeah, the stress lives in very various parts of our body. So it, no wonder it's, it's going to be your number one cause. Like we, oh, you talked yeah. about the back of the brain, how we're connected to the C1. So if I'm experiencing a stressful traumatic situation, there could be an interception there. Then you're talking about in part of my body where I'm holding stress. And so there's all sorts of areas that we impact or can impact. Yet it's like, no, it's like you said earlier, such simple solutions or such simple mm -hmm. things that maybe are behind this however by the time maybe a patient like the one you were just talking about it's we got this big story because it's been so painful it's been all our whole life that we think yeah there's no way that i can fix this because for however, 20 however many years well, you're trying, dealing yeah, with i it. was doing the right thing like in my head like i was i went out and i was trying to progress healing or at least to be better what, you know, like, yeah. and I think everybody is like, Doing the best if you're again, in pain, yeah. you're going to try a bunch of things. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I tried a bunch of things mm -hmm. and one worked. Right. Sorry. A lot of them worked. One held. I mean, so far. Because you managed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it only heals if it holds. So 
and that's right? another thought of Remember that I'm this. thinking now, like for anybody listening or anybody we talk to, how would they be able to say, okay, well, maybe I have a C1 or maybe I should go get this checked. Is there a, like a self kind of like check? Like how would I have known that? Uh, you know what I mean? Really, if things aren't getting better, you should assume it's a C1 issue. Yeah. And when I say a C1 issue, because, you know, somebody that knows anatomy will be like, well, everybody has a C1. So, for so sure, for sure. everybody has a C1. So if you have a C1 syndrome, I just like to clarify that. because yeah. you, you know, certain yeah. people will be like, well, everybody has a C1. Yeah. So if you have a C1, I, so we use that as a layman's term. Sure, sure. But if you have a C1 syndrome, uh, like you should assume you have it. If yeah. you have an array of things that aren't getting better, you should assume it. Physically. Because, yes. But like what, because can we, we talk about those again? Those array of things? Because I think sometimes people can, don't connect that. Well, okay. mine, like even my shoulder was out. and like The clicking. Uh, and the back, like right in between my shoulder blades was always sore. Yes. But that's because your C1 syndrome on its grading system, because right. you have a zero to a five, a five is the worst. Mm-hmm. When you're at a four and a five, it affects the entire side of your body. Yeah. Because you're using everything, other parts to supplement. It affects the nerves the feeding nerves. everything down to your toes. Which is my right side. Yeah. yeah. Right? So it can affect plantar fasciitis. It can affect the knee, the hip, no the way. low back. Da, da, da. Like you, it is of the whole side. With a less severity, then it could just be isolated here. But the moment we go to a grade four, it will be shoulder and everything down affected neurologically which will impair the majority mm. of the structures and cause accelerated breakdown. You will irritate it more than you heal it. You are in right. a chronic state instantly, right? <laughs> and not everything in between is going on. Right. Yeah. So do you want me to explain a little bit please, of the anatomy please. of what's going on? Yes, yes, Just yes. so we can look at the symptoms. So Thank you. when we talk about the C1, at the very top of the cervical spine, right underneath the base of the skull, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That is where your C1, which is a very unstable, your C1 on your C2, very unstable joint. So that C1 can deviate forward. And when it does, it encroaches on space and nerves don't like that. And again, it's a two-lane wave. So we've talked about the fact that it has an effect, an inhibitory effect on the frontal lobe. Now, what inhibitory means is it is a decreased signal toward that structure. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it, it's just where, say, if I flex my bicep muscle, it will inhibit my tricep muscle. It's it's a reflexive mm-hmm. property. It's a diminishing of that. So it is a diminished signal. So a couple of key things is going down from that C1. If that C1 is affected, various muscles and structures are impaired because that signal is diminished and therefore inhibited. Now we get it that it affects muscles. Yeah. That's super straightforward key thing to in addition to look at that is the other most important thing that it affects is your vagus nerve Mm -hmm. and if anybody knows anything about the vagus nerve and keeps doing vagal tone exercises and everything that is the number one compression site of your vagus nerve it can get irritated at other points is the c1 is the c1 Mm -hmm. anatomically it is in front of the c1 and can be irritated the video you're going to put up Mm -hmm. demonstrates it does yeah yeah so all of a sudden, yeah. it, when you know what it connects to, which we call innervation, when it when it, what it feeds is going to be heart, lungs, spleen, immunity, right? Yeah, your sp- Digestive yeah. system, all those things. So any impairment of all that, why would you not think C1 first? Or if you're doing anything, like because the liver is well in there mm-hmm. and all that, why would you not think if I'm going to do anything or something's wrong with it? Could it be my C1, mm-hmm. right? Because one of the things that vagus nerves, which is why there's a, a gut-brain connection, mm-hmm. is through your vagus nerve. Sure. It is your vagus nerve. That is the name of what connects it. So when you irritate that vagus nerve, you will have lower stomach acid, which is the absorption of things like iron and calcium and all that. So bit that people with low uh, bone density or low iron. Mm-hmm. Did they ask if they have low stomach acid? Mm-mm. Right. I'm, just, I'm yeah. thinking of a family member right now and I'm just, I wish they were sitting in this room because this is their medical sort of whole, what's the word? Book. I Book. Guess, yeah. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, we don't, we, there's never been that kind of a conversation. Yeah. So what feeds the area? But what did just, I say? Yeah. Nerve, muscle, muscle. If you don't look at the neurological input regardless of your symptom be it anxiety or stomach pains or anything you get lost so when we when that vagus nerve is irritated 
we decrease the enzyme production in the stomach, mm -hmm. right? The digestive enzymes. And the moment you have uh, vagus nerve involvement, you increase gut permeability. How many people have leaky gut? Oh, that's so like if a the muscles, trending thing right now. But if muscles are inhibited, they are they lose their integrity. So when your vagus nerve is impaired, what, that gut lining loses its integrity, mm. gut lining, and you develop sensitivities. And then we have all these food problems. And you know what people don't look at? The C1. Yeah. And think, how do I improve my responsiveness to taking my glutamine powder to mm. cinch up my gut lining? It's not going to fix that. Mm. Right. It's too low down the, the totem pole. You need to fix the root in order to cinch it up. Now I can give you examples to no end, but I did testing to reveal this for myself. Yeah. And I was doing food sensitivity testing every three months before, and then it would change every three months, which is unheard of most of the time for most people. And it would change all the time. And I would, I know my symptoms. It was dry eye. Every time I would eat a reactive food, my eyes would go dry, mm. dry, dry, dry. I would get blinky. I would feel very tired. And I'm like, I'm not tired. My eyes are just so dry. Mm. If I don't eat those foods, never happens to me. So what happens is, is that that leaky gut, it just, at the moment that my C1 actually held from my, my prolotherapy and it tightened up and I got rid of it, it was if within weeks all of my food sensitivities vanished wow. because I unimpaired things. Yeah. We're chasing symptoms yeah. all the time. And it's just, remember, it's not pain. It's emotional things. It's the way we function, all that stuff. And it, it's just, but most of our money goes to, I need to relieve this symptom and this symptom based on the chart from the video. That's right. Yeah. Without yeah. looking at, let's see the big picture. Let's address my C1. Let's address my diet. Let's yeah. address my stress response. Can't take it away. Yeah. Well, we can cope better. Yeah. And you go down that road. Well, and the body's so resilient that I think when you're out of sync or, or your C1's out or something's wrong, your body makes up for it or oh, tries yes. to make up for it here, tries mm -hmm. to make up for it there. And mm -hmm. so you just live with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, exactly. I'm not, but that was the thing. Like, for me, I was like, I'm okay. But now I'm like, oh, this is, and now if, oh, there's a pain in my leg or there's kind of a pain in my lower back because I never felt those yeah. pains because it was, I have so much radiating pain out of my neck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And pain inhibits pain in the body, right? Mm -hmm. Like you yeah. could have back pain, smash your toe with a hammer and tell me how that goes. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's just the way we are. That's and it. people always tell me, they're like, Oh yeah, it's moving around. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. It just, yeah. the pain intensity varies and changes. Yeah. And so you just get a new issue. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. being right sore on. from working out or being sore mm -hmm. from like doing something, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. that's and I muscles. always was. Right. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But right? that's why, why you have self-care exercises that say I right. teach you or do things because mm -hmm. you shouldn't come in for those reasons. Right. Which yeah. is why we roll. Yeah. But that's because if you're functional, you are responsive to home care rolling. And I always tell people, before you come see me, roll for a couple of days. Don't come in and, and maybe work yeah. on that spot that yeah. you could have just fixed on and your that's own. What Rich that's what yeah. I, I, I'm not here for that. I'm here for the tough stuff. I like the challenging cases. Yeah, yeah. Right. If you can just roll it out at home, don't spend the time and money coming in. Just deal with it because yeah. I've taught you the tools. Can we talk about the roll? Because the, you, you actually developed your own roll release foam roller technique. Mm -hmm. One and thing I want to cover before yes, that. The yeah. last thing about the 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 c1 connection anatomically yeah which is super important which goes to um this whole fight and flight response mm -hmm. and your adaptive response is that there's a branch off of your vagus nerve that feeds your body's parasympathetic system okay so what? you have rest and just and fight and flight and it will be in the video mm -hmm. you just got to apply that information um so what happens is if that parasympathetic branch of your vagus nerve is impaired what is the only other option you will go into a sympathetic state and be in fight and flight on a regular basis hmm. how do you sleep if you are in fight and flight how do you digest if you are in fight and flight yeah how can you even calm yourself you and i see people yeah. it's so interesting it's just Imagine because when pressures. i when i see all the variety of patients that i've seen oh yeah exactly and and just so i have these people that are like they meditate but i'm like yeah. but they have to 
force themselves and try so hard. I'm like, why do you have to try so hard to get into a meditative state? <laughs> I've, heard, you're I've heard a lot of people saying, I can't meditate. No, because I, uh, you're wired. Yeah. And some people just don't like it. Yeah. I, sure, I, don't, sure. I, don't, I don't I don't. I don't much. love it either. <laughs> no. But I, what I I'm saying is, <laughs> but why can you not get into a parasympathetic state and mm. why do you need to always meditate if you're not somebody that wants to? It's yeah. because your parasympathetic system if you, even if you have a mild C1 syndrome, will be inhibited and you will be in a sympathetic state. And you can say that even that branch of affected means it'll affect your digestion. It'll affect your sleep. It'll affect your well-being because you are in a sympathetic state. And what do you think a sympathetic state is? Anxiety. Mm. See where I'm going with this? Yeah. So if you're going, going, well, I can't, I, I need to buzz around the house. That's an anxious behavior. Yes. So my partner, whenever she has a C1 deviation, Oh, she starts cleaning everything. I'm like, what are you doing? And then I'm like, can I check you? And, and all that stuff. And we do it gently. And yeah. it's so nice. Yeah. And she's happy. It completely, because her main symptom is anxiety, completely calms her anxiety. And I see it firsthand. Yeah. And I, I, there's certain behaviors that certain people do. So you can just see it would rev up your neurological yeah. system. It heightens it. Totally. So again, we can't fix it because my partner may take meds for it and things like that. But we can decrease severity yeah mm. yeah and if you make it more culpable and you can live with that yeah isn't that better well oh, yeah, yeah because you're then not going to be going to the hospital for having a heart attack and, and all the other or panic major attack, right? mm-hmm. but also like all the major yeah panic attack all these sorts of things that are when you're in a heightened state like fight or flight that you're in a trauma response but that's just it because i remember my daughter when she was getting tested for anxiety and all that or the sheet of you know this is too much this is too low and yeah. we want to kind of be in here my you're always up here you're always up here yeah and i'm looking at it like yeah <laughs> I know, but there's a way to calm the nervous system mm-hmm. well, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. You know, so it's super interesting. Yeah. And I can tell you, like, I've seen people that have come to me from neurologists, which I respect. Yes. But you know, when you go to a child neurologist and you know their condition, they won't hear what you have to say yeah. about upper cervical instability. This is the fight that I have all oh, the time yeah, yeah. because I get such opposition to it. Even though it's a medical doctor that has come up with this term still not valid. Mm-hmm. So the solution for my daughter to, to deal with these symptoms, it was diagnosed as autonomia, which means dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, which okay. means as a diagnosis, no rationale as to fixing it, yeah. should eat too. more salt and protein. Yeah. And that was it. Now I agree with the outcomes, but there was no fix. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Because a diagnosis should mean that you have a fix. Right. If I have somebody coming from me with uh, cervical dystonia, I look at them and they're health practitioners. I'm like, do you understand what that diagnosis is? And, and, and they're like, no, I'm just like low tone of your cervical spine. I'm like, do you know what to do about that? She's like, well, I have no plan. But that diagnosis was from a neurologist. And I'm like, so what are you doing? Taking meds? Because that's, we, we can test and find. And I asked them, did your neurologist, did your, your neurologist do neurological testing? Yeah. No. No. Yeah. No, they didn't. So they didn't see that all of the motor function of the neck was impaired and have a, a test retest outcome yeah. measure yeah. to test and see if they could fix something. Well, sometimes it's just that rigid Q and A. So you go into a neurologist. First of all, you wait two years to get in. Mm-hmm. And so you get in and then it, it would be uh, disheartening to learn that you finally get in and you're just having a series of back and forth generic questions. And we're all, maybe our pain is, you know, coming from a similar source, but the cause, as we're talking about today, can be from various things. Mm-hmm. So, you're, so you would hope your neurologist is asking the right questions to figure out where you as a unique person are versus well, general. So if they didn't do this testing, then right. yeah, so now you're, now what? Right. And so the thing is reassurance for me comes from telling people what it is so that they know they're not crazy, but also telling them that there's something they can do about it. Because usually people are just told this is what it is, live with it. Well, and you want, when you tell people what they can do is also teaching people how they can be responsible and take charge of something that's happening to them or with them. And Mm -hmm. that, that is what we talk a lot about mental health these bad things happen to you, whether it's something traumatic or what. And at some point, uh, as we are becoming adults and are adults, we have to find a way to be responsible. Not saying that it was my fault that I had that accident or that bad traumatic thing. Just this is what's happened. And I have to learn now how to live with it and work with it and 
hopefully come to a resolution or something towards it. But when we don't have that, yeah, well, we, we no wonder we're crazy. We are crazy. We feel we're like we're crazy. How, how are you going to convince me I'm not mm -hmm. when a neurologist told me what they told me? And I would agree. I would I would be that person that'd be like, but the, the brain doctor, they're, they know mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now you have to like fight, fight, fight this with your, your patients. Totally. And, your and that's just where I don't understand why we all can't converse. work together. Yeah. Right. Isn't yeah. it about the patient? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not about the business. It's about how yeah. can we do this? But, you know, I get pushed back. Like my ego versus all the your time. ego versus yeah. this ego. But also, Absolutely. like, there's, like, these weird ethics, too. Because if, if you remember during COVID, when they were trying to find the cure, uh, there were so many scientists and so many doctors and all sorts of people around the world that they finally sort of lifted this weird ban. Mm -hmm. and that's, like, the simplest way I can put it. And, and people were able to come together and work together. And I remember my, doc, my doctor friend saying there are so many articles now coming out there we're on the brink of a lot of discovery because it's the first time that people in today's world felt like they were able to come together from all over the world and try to find and it really goes to what you're saying if we don't have this wraparound approach mm -hmm. then yeah we're isolating it and working on one thing over here and that one thing may not that's down the line that's my joint yeah. <laughs> sort of that thing i can get to eventually but i got to start at the top over here mm -hmm. and we don't we don't get that we don't do that mm -hmm. So yeah, now I'm gonna pop the pills that my neurologist gave me or whatever doctor gave me and ho hope for the best, I guess. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't work, then yeah, totally I'm a Eeyore. It makes sense why I am. Totally. But then some people find me or find a way to correct Isn't it, that which is good. Isn't that fascinating how they find you too? Like, yeah, it's... You know, is, and it's usually word of mouth? Always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Nobody can understand what it is that I do. I, I ask people <laughs> when they come in because they've seen other cars. I'm like... Do you know what it is that I do? They were like, "Well, not really. I just you were, I was told that you can fix me." I'm yeah. like, oh, "You helped." Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know about Maybe. fixing, yeah. but yes, I can help you. I will do things very differently, and I just tell people I am a functional practitioner. I'm not it's not about chiropractic, it's not about this. It's about helping the body be restorative. Does that mean cuz one of my colleagues is a massage therapist because it's within his scope to do mobilizations on the neck. So can he treat a C1? Yes, they can. Can a physio? Yes, they can. Hmm. Can any of these professions learn to do what it is that I do? All of them can, and they should, and you know, many will. Because mm -hmm. yeah. as I get the course going, mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure mm -hmm. that we create a better standard. Because somebody has to create the change. Yeah. That's why I started rolling. Yeah. Because yeah. I used to be a personal trainer back in Toronto when I was in Cairo College. Yeah, that I was also watch. on your long list on your uh, I know. <laughs> I got lots. It's all irrelevant. What I do now is just functional sort of scaffolding and yeah you know, you're getting to this this part of your totally yeah. so with the rolling uh, as a personal trainer i just saw people rolling on these big foam tubes and they were just grimacing all the time and for me <laughs> it it's is, always I know, like yeah you, my, my one thing will be why does it have to be that hard yeah, yeah. why do you I, that's have why to I struggle don't roll. totally oh, like when you need it it's yeah. not for everybody but that's where you have to know what is my body responsive what's going on why does it hurt so much? Because mm -hmm. it's not supposed to hurt. When you go for a massage, are you grimacing and like, ow, I can't stand this? Mm -hmm. No, it should be a nice therapeutic massage. So that's what rolling should be. So I ended up just being like, okay, I don't like this. I have to make it better. Because, you know, I could be somebody that just be, I don't like this and complain about it, but mm -hmm. I always do something. So yeah. I wrote a book. you outside the box. I do. Mm -hmm. I don't like boxes. Uh, <laughs> I live way outside of it. So I wrote a book on it. I made an app and I, and I just started working with a rolling company to just make sure that there was a standard, not this whole lay on it and it hurts. There's like maybe like seven body positions per muscle to roll it based mm -hmm. on different tolerances. Why are you doing it? So if somebody has functional issues, you shouldn't be doing things that are painful like a thigh. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't even touch that yet. It's so far down the chain, Yeah. right? But rolling is simply self-massage mm -hmm. on a cylindrical tube or a ball or whatever it is, and you're just massaging, right? But if you have a muscle strain, nerve muscles, ligaments, joints, I deal with nerves. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with the muscles? Well, you could come see me like, lots of times or you could just do it at home every day yeah right yeah right because yeah. if you don't correct still that muscle health it will not protect the ligaments what happens to the ligaments they become lax and don't protect a joint and then, and then going yeah on. but then you risk early arthritic changes yeah mm. right so there are people that come to me and say oh i have early arthritic changes what can i do yeah well guess what you can do you can do prolo tighten it up stop that acceleration right yeah. 
Right. You, so there's you, things you we can make, do. You can't make a hundred percent, but you can prevent it from getting worse. Yes, exactly. It. Yeah. So I can't, I, I can halt it yeah. and stop it from getting worse. I can't undo it. Right. Yeah. But why would you not want to look and be like, Oh yeah, I, I have this issue. Like, what can I do now? That's right. Versus mm-hmm. just like, it's a death sentence and that's all I can do. Hey, that's like living with trauma, right? These bad things that happen to us, whether it's on our body or in our mind, and we think we have to live with it and, you know, live a sad life and sometimes mm-hmm. an angry life, a s- criminal life or what, addictive life. And yet we can't undo all those things. And maybe we don't want to because it's not bad to remember yeah. some of these things that happen. We can learn what we can do moving forward and breaks, you know, generational uh, p- patterns and cycles. Right. So now you have your, stuff for right? Sure. Like you mm-hmm. have your, your daughter now that's getting something from you that sure you could have benefited from, but the, the education, the knowledge, all that wasn't there at that Keep time. Growth, yeah. It's here now. Mm-hmm. And so when you do this course to, before we continue with the rolling and the app and the, cause you just threw mm-hmm. in there, I did a book and, a, and an app. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We want to talk about this. I, I, when I was on the phone with you, I wanted to clarify this because Carrie had told me you this was something that you developed. And I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, sure. So let me just, you know. And so I even said to you, like, did you develop this? Or did is this, like, from someone else? But this is your technique. Can this you is just, my technique. Like, help us understand a little bit how you, how, how you develop this. So obviously, you're... A, a person that looks for solution mm-hmm. and so you you develop this and then you wrote a book and then you have this app so can you just tell us a little bit more information about it should somebody want to get Absolutely, on your app because it needs to, to be roll? reproducible yes right okay. and so that's where it can't be so varied and just people have pain to do it yes and it has to work yeah that's why you know we use this term functional foam rolling and the reason we use the term functional is because it restores function it restores function. So if you strain a muscle, that muscle actually starts to lose its function. So if you roll it, you will restore that function right. and the way that it operates at 100%. Mm-hmm. But if you roll any deviation off of how I teach it, you have uncertainty. So people will roll too aggressively so it hurts, which doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, if you're not rolling at the right frequency, uh, the right depth, the right tool, all those things, it actually doesn't work. That's why people have found that rolling, oh, rolling didn't really work for me. Yeah. I always look like, well, were you responsive? Were you functional? Did you use the right technique? Yeah. All of that. Right. Right. And yeah. so all those variables are very important. Even if we look back at Prolo, if you use the wrong dose, you don't use the right frequency, not mm-hmm. the right region. Like it's all those things mm-hmm. that if it didn't work, was it done properly just because somebody told you to do it doesn't mean it's the best way that's right we have evolved all these things to make sure and it's mm-hmm. testable right. why do i think the rolling works because i test it yeah. it's not a matter of uh, because i like it that way and it's yeah. my personal opinion yeah just like personal trainers how they train everybody like they train themselves yeah. it's i've tested repeatedly to make sure that patient outcomes improved mm-hmm. with what i gave them mm-hmm. So as a result, when you're a patient of mine who's a friend and we just developed an app, right? Just have videos because it's so hard to look at a picture because the book was based on pictures. And so we just evolved that just as a, a resource and a reference for people. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. So would you recommend that someone go ahead, download that app and utilize it? Or would you recommend they get a little bit like a tutorial? That's something that you would tell them once they're your patient? Totally. So if they're a patient, I always teach them. The first step for me for the basic things, I have a YouTube channel. So I just tell people just YouTube my name and just go find some of those. If there's There's a lot of videos. There are. Yeah. 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 But if there's something more complicated, that's where the app, if you just go to the website, foamrollerapp.com, people can just find that. Uh, that's it. The book is just like a backup reference, but yeah. because it's pictures, I don't use it that much because you need to actually see, see the it. actual action yeah. of it. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. You have one of those rollers. Hey, Carrie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. And the ball. And the ball too. Yeah. Need yep. the ball. So how's that going for you? Well, you know, the patient has to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's part of the, the success rate, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. There's like, there's your success rate, but also part of that percentage is what is your it's patient It's interesting doing when you start after? feeling better, how you're like, oh, I'm better now. But I might like be seventy totally. percent, and I'm like, I'm seventy percent is way better than yeah. than 
10. Yeah. But that's why rolling, when I give it to anybody, it's a backup because mm. I don't like that thing where if somebody's like, I'm not getting better. I'm like, okay, did we cover all bases? I'm, and I yeah. go through it. Yeah. But sometimes when I work on the underlying cause, the majority of things just get better on their own. Yeah. yeah. Over time, would yeah. it take a little bit longer? Because rolling or self-care is made to accelerate that recovery. Right. But, you yeah. know, if things yeah. just get better, I'm like, well, okay. Yeah. If you have no pain, then... Okay, now, of course, I do think that pain and symptomatic relief is only halfway because there are some things that still need to recover. But if you're content, I'm content. Right. Yeah. I don't make people want what I want. Yes. I meet them where they're at. And That's I learned right. that a long time ago that, you know, I wanted things and then they wouldn't do it. And I'd be all frustrated. And I'm like, what's why is it my problem? Yeah. If they're happy, so what? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, you're pushing yeah. your own stuff. Yeah. yeah. There's a there's a line and I see that too when I have colleagues that are doing therapy with their clients and they can you can see the problem, you get it, you understand it and then the trick is really how do you how do you bring your client along? to get there themselves and you were sort of saying that earlier too it's a dialogue it's a back and forth it's not you talking at them it's together coming because if you can together come up with a solution and they understand along the way they're going to likely keep up with that or do mm-hmm. what they need to do to continue mm-hmm. um f- working on that and i remember you saying that too is what you what carrie really appreciated uh about you is that you talk in a way that he's like i finally understood I finally understood mm. what what the problem is, right? Like the you, why. Yeah, the why, yeah. exactly. And you talk a lot about that today. Mm-hmm. It's like, what is the why behind it? Can, totally. we get, can we start there? Yeah, and that's why you asked about what I tell people and I, where, where I said that yeah. I demonstrate. Yeah. yeah, Because what I do is a little bit different at the beginning. Mm-hmm. So people are like, are you not pushing as hard? Are you? Ma-? I'm yeah. like, I'm not here to convince you of anything. I'm here yeah. to just demonstrate. Yeah. You can formulate your own opinion after this. Right. And if it makes sense and resonates with you, we do this and yeah. we correct things. Right, mm-hmm. that's it. yeah. I just, I wanted to go back a little bit. I kind of missed a piece and I was really curious about uh, just a little bit of like culture and demographics, I mm-hmm. guess, in some ways when we, I know we're kind of on the path to healing right now. We're talking about the roller and different techniques, but if we just can go back to when we were talking about the pain and the folks that come to you, I'm curious about, do you see pain translated differently through cultures? Do you see different ethnicities? Do you see do. pain different between men and women? You also were in the sports world, so mm-hmm. I'd imagine what an athlete's translation of pain is like would be different. So can we, I'm really curious. So you said you do. So can we talk a little bit about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what, how do you see it when you say you do, what do you see that's different? Uh, so culturally, I, I do see that sometimes various cultures feel like, you know, either pain is normal or they just need to suck it up. Yeah. Right. That yeah. it's like, or, you know, various things. So that could be cultural or age. People say, I'm old, I expect to be in pain. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's wrong. Yeah. I had a patient's dad come to see me last week. They were traveling and they were on a beach and he had this excruciating back pain over the holiday mm-hmm. and all that. He comes to me. I've only seen him once before. And he comes to me and he says, well, both of my brothers are chiropractors. So, um, you know, I'm pretty sure it's just a disc. I just need to be adjusted and I'm good. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't do traditional stuff, right? right? So did I adjust them? Yes, because I figured out exactly where the nerve was irritated because, mm-hmm. you know, it's a nerve problem, right? Because he didn't have any trauma, yeah. but a lot of pain. Right. If you have that in equation, what does that mean, right? Yeah. And and so what happened is one treatment comes back a week later and I'm like, how you doing? You know, because he's slow moving and all that. Because remember, with age, it just equals pain, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, course. it doesn't because you know what happened? He was like, I'm 90% better and I'm doing everything I did before. Oh, wow. Hey. Because he had the right treatment, fast, yeah. accurately, and right. he's 80. Wow. Oh, goodness, so yeah. I, I don't agree with this whole age because anybody that comes in in pain says, I feel old. We've, we've come yeah. to that, but yes. it's not an age thing and it, it's not a cultural thing or mm-hmm. a, a socioeconomical thing. Like it's, it's not mm-hmm. right. It's a, if you have pain, fix where it comes from. Yeah. Period. Mm-hmm. As much as you can, mm-hmm. if it, if it takes a multidimensional approach, go for it. But my goal is to correct things as fast as possible. So it doesn't come down to that. People don't have enough money to do this ongoing. I didn't say we're doing this ongoing. I'm going to give you the ability to treat this at home, only do what I need to do. And that needs to be the approach to have better overall utilization of proper care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if everybody treated like that, you know, we did this practitioners treated like this and patients got treated like this. 
we'd have way more treatment utilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred percent. Because people would get better and they would refer. Yeah. But most practitioners out there hold on to people like, this is my patient. Yeah. I'm going to lose them and then they milk them and they do all these things. Yeah. I'm like, I push them out the door basically. I'm like, tell all your friends, yeah. you know, yeah. because I know that that's where the reputation would serve people better. Right. Then I just want this one person coming back to me all the time. Well, yeah. I, I personally think people coming back continuously is not success. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and is not adding value to their life. Well, and, and like you said, you're trying to shift this culture that we've all known for generations that that's how the medical systems worked. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, I had, I had people on, I had somebody on for uh, eating disorder and she talked about, uh, part of this came out when she was actually on another episode about, uh, she's having infertility struggles mm-hmm. and she would. Part of her infertility struggle, she got diagnosed with PCOS. It mm. impacted her ability to get pregnant. Yes. In this time, she was in and out of the hospital, and she had a. She was never diagnosed with an eating disorder, and that's a hard one to diagnose. But she had severe symptoms, and she, they kept treating her for dehydration and these sorts of things. And no one ever cared to ask her other questions. That that the signs were there. And she was obviously not going to come out. She's like, I didn't want people to catch me because unfortunately it worked. Like I was losing weight. But because she wasn't skin and bones thin, she said she was generally a bigger person. So she lost a significant amount of weight. But because she didn't go to skin and bones, what an eating disorder patient would look like, she didn't look like one. So she didn't get asked the questions. But she was in and out of the hospital multiple times. And there was no connection to, why are you always dehydrated? Hmm, this is a symptom of, you know, something different. Let's ask this. Yeah. And so her her eating disorder impacted her ability to conceive. And so she's, you know, on this path to IVF and all this, but I think about that often because her example is one of many of us that keep going back, keep going back to the doctor because we think it's okay for the time being or it can't be that bad because I'm not falling dead or whatever it is. I don't need surgery, so we look at the worst thing that we treatment we need and Mm -hmm. we think well it's not that bad that i would need surgery and this expectation of pain tolerance is is amazing Mm -hmm. that you know and i'm sure and i would imagine in the sports world with athletes it would be similar especially working with a lot of male athletes and we we can understand how that toxicity can can be and so there's all these sorts of little things that i think suck in a way because we we are all living in this culture where we fix is not part of our language Mm -hmm. and so here you are talking about well actually let's challenge that Mm -hmm. and here are some stats you got one sitting in the room with you Mm -hmm. that that's saying well maybe there there is something it's not as complicated as we're as we're making it but sometimes can be right it's not also as simple but yeah starting at that at your with your nervous system starting with the c1 and all the different branches that it connects it's it's like insane in many ways when you think about it but it's also it makes so much sense on another level yeah that you just you th- or like you said well i'm 70 percent, i'm 80 percent, so i'll and take that, that and that's the thing where like i'll never say i can fix it but i've never not seen it help somebody right right yeah. to basically the question is to what extent if it's a problem will it help somebody yeah because pain is not normal nor is lingering pain yeah and we have to start just processing that right yeah. Yeah. I always think the time that pain is a good thing is when you're in labor, <laughs> mm-hmm. something good's going to come out and there's a level of pain. There's the extreme, right? Where you need mm-hmm. different, but most times when you're having that kind of pain, something good's going to come out in a couple hours or however long mm-hmm. you're going to have a little baby in your hands. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, when you are experiencing excruciating pain, there, there has to be a relief or otherwise our well-being and our quality of life is going to be impacted and we're not going to be the best people we want to be to our kids, our partners, our, yeah. our job, wherever it is. And yeah. so... Well, because um, when things happen acutely, people will get frustrated and say, damn, I can't believe I sprained my ankle, I hurt something. And then they see it continually get better and they're hopeful. But it's when it lingers, it just mm-hmm. weighs on you. Mm-hmm. And it's just that's when you get defeated. Mm-hmm. Or you keep getting re-injured. Why is it that I keep hurting this part of my body over and over? I thought it was healed. Yeah, why does my ankle always pop or always whatever? Right, right? exactly. Yeah, how come? What's that about? Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe you know. I have have a buddy of mine. 
his knee is always sore. Not just a bit, he's in a lot of pain all the time. And he's like, well, I need surgery. And it's, it's like essentially bone bone on bone. Okay. And he's like, I need surgery. I'm like, I don't know what you, sh- if that's what you're gonna do, you're gonna do it. But I always think that should be the last thing mm-hmm. to, to do. Cut your, cut your body, your body open. open. Yeah. First so of all, s- cutting. But the second question is how long is that knee replacement gonna last before they gotta get a second knee replacement? Yeah. Because they only last so long. So it depends oh, on their yeah. age. Yeah. That if you get a hip replacement, it doesn't last forever. Yeah. Okay. Right. Like eventually, yeah, you might fairly young. Have he's to. fairly young. Yeah. So yeah. that's why you look and say, okay, like for some people, I know some people that, like, I know a gentleman our age that has had a hip replacement, and that was what he chose, but that was the last thing yeah. that he could do. Now I know it's difficult because obviously he's not here. You're not being. You're not able to like speak with him. And, mm. But I guess as a generalization, is there something potentially you could do there? I'm not giving you any. I'm not giving you a lot of mm-hmm. stuff to diagnose, obviously. Totally. But. but relatively, that's where you try every conservative thing you can mm. because it's a weight-bearing joint. So you're going to be rubbing on that and irritating it every day. Mm-hmm. So the question comes down to how to decrease the level of irritation to see if you can manage that. Yeah. Right? I can't build that joint back up or anything, but the first thing I would do is functional because function first. Mm-hmm. Everything is function first. Function first. Yeah. Nerve muscles, ligaments, joints, mm-hmm. function first, or else everything is less responsive because that's mm-hmm. a joint that's fourth down the road, right? Yeah. So you look at function and make sure that the nerves feed the muscles because muscles stabilize joints. Mm. And the muscles need to stabilize those ligaments and the ligaments hold that joint. Mm -hmm. But but what I said earlier was that if there's laxity of those ligaments, then the joint is not protected and it's probably rubbing more than it needs to. So you have to look at it biomechanically and just make sure are the muscles working well and something like doing prolo to tighten up all the ligaments. You can inject in the area, reduce inflammation because sometimes that's where pain comes and then evaluate it. Why would you not take it to the lengths that you can go before it's just like, nah, I give up. Yeah, yeah okay. that's right? just it. You need to exhaust your options and say, no, I've done everything. That all was good, but it wasn't enough. And for my quality of life, this is what I need. Yeah. Then I support every person that ever comes into my office and says, I'm getting a hip replacement or a knee replacement. I'm like, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. We've done everything we can. Right. There is nothing left. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what would, as a percentage, would that be fairly low? In terms of, of rep- you saying, you know what, I'm, I'm done. Oh, very low because I don't see a lot of people yeah. with it because yeah. we're always working on doing it or getting relief. Right, right, right. Right. I have patients that have large disc herniations. They're not going for back surgery because mm. they're happy with where they're at, where we get them to yeah. or all these other things. But there are times where we've tried and it's been only maybe, maybe one handful of people where yeah. I'm like, yeah, you're ready. Fair I'll support enough. you. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. they, or they went too far down that. Totally. Down yeah. That yeah. And they were just road. in pain and yeah. we tried all the stuff and it just, we couldn't make enough of improvement for them right. to have a quality of life. Sure. And so then you have to, but when they have had it and they knew that that was the last thing on their list, mm. they were, all of them have always been thrilled with it. Well, at least you they know did it, now. Yeah. But then they knew that they did exhaust things right. and that there was no other option. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But that that's, you can only like get them so many times. So it's like you want to prolong it as much as you can. Sure. Yeah. So what about for, for like you hear about nerve block injections mm-hmm. and we're talking a lot about helping the nerves, right? Mm-hmm. Like kind of, and so if we're just blocking it, what's that about? Just basically killing it or numbing it. And we, we, if that, that. Is that not like a problem? Because that's not the beginning of our assessment with nerves, mm-hmm. muscles. Like so. But did it, they assess the nerves? But that's a good question. Well, I don't know what this is. Yeah. So they're actually injecting your nerve so you don't feel pain anymore? Is that... Yeah, sometimes they burn it. Sometimes they will inject it with Like a pretty a big various... needle as well. I think I've, it's like quite a, I've never seen quite a process but, right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nerve block. it's just to either numb it or hurt the nerves so that it's just not creating mm. those impulses. But yeah, that's like kind of like some people treating migraines with Botox. So it's like, Oh, totally. It's, it's, it's symptomatic. It, yeah. You bandaid on it temporarily. Mm-hmm. You get some relief yep. and then eventually the yeah, wrinkles I've, I've, come I've, back. I've never had anybody do a nerve block because I fix nerves. Yeah. yeah. So it's personal preference. And if yeah. they go down that, but I can tell you like, I know there's some great practitioners that just, don't go to the extent of fixing things and they have recommend patients do this and that. There's nothing I can say. But like you said, it's also yeah. like old school uh, way of treating too. So our 
your medical, the medical system and all that knowledge, like we said, we're growing constantly. So it, it's always interesting that health system is evolving, but it doesn't feel that way when you're yeah, stuck. It's just because their toolboxes are so small. Right, it's just they but can only do things. But that's a problem for me because yes. that's should be. You're, you're. These are people that went to school to help us live and you know fix ourselves and what that. And your toolbox to me, like that's kind of unacceptable. Mm-hmm. And I feel sorry. For, I'm sorry for saying that, but it is like you're you're the doctor, and your job. That's your job. And some people are better at doing the job than other people. I get that. But what? How, why is it that your whoever whatever registration you're accountable accountable to isn't saying that we have all these other practices out there we have all these knowledge out there and we have to build our toolbox like yeah, why well, are... and i think we should be careful like painting all like doctors with the same brush right how, like, and this is a hundred percent and i, I yeah. thank you for that i this isn't all or not I, I you're right we're not saying all are doing that i'm just speaking from the perspective of a patient mm. who like many would say that our experience and maybe i'll just stop there and say my experience isn't that i i find the handful of doctors that are doing things outside the box yeah, you're right have- there are, i have fr- doctor friends that are I, I get that even therapists i have therapist mm-hmm. friends who i'm like it blows my mind that that's how you're doing that tr- that's amazing that you're going to that place to do the treatment that way with this cl- this client mm. and then there's therapists out there that will stick to traditional talk therapy whatever it right. is and the traditional could help and it does sure, help yeah. totally and maybe that's maybe i just answered my question then maybe maybe that some of these doctors and some of the ways of working it does work for some people for some i've had lots of opposition i've had patients go talk to their doc who has told them not to do prolo yeah prolo mm. therapy and said, no, nah, I wouldn't do it, even though I've evaluated them have, have as having instability. Yeah. So, But the doctor's also just, not giving other options, no. too. It's like, don't do this, no. but I don't have anything else totally. for but you But that's either. what I'm saying. If, it, if it's not, I think it's just important to understand what we do and we know and what we don't. I just know, I, I just, I hear a lot of negative experiences with people coming, feeling not heard not treated, all yeah. those things. And I'm not saying that that's just the way it is, when you're gonna but see it happens that a lot, all the time. 100%. Like and I see one side of it. Right. I yeah. do for sure. And I know a lot of people go and feel cured. Like, you know, if I've got a bacterial infection and, and you, you treat it, like you just probably saved my life. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. And all that stuff. But I do see the musculoskeletal pain, but we just have to stick with the realm that we're good at. And if you don't know, pass on. But the typical thing is, Oh, you have that? Okay, just go see a physio. And then you just get lost in that mix again mm-hmm. because it is not their expertise. Yeah. And, they, and as long as you can say, I don't know, or it's just not my expertise, so you should talk to somebody else and go find yourself an appropriate person. Mm-hmm. Not just say you need this profession, but find yeah. a person, you know, get a referral from friends or something. Because mm-hmm. I feel like sometimes your referral from a practitioner is not as good as like mm-hmm. a conversation with yeah. Who or even if you Google like Google reviews are great now. That's how people find me and find the C one stuff because they're like, oh, I saw that your Google reviews. People were saying that you were able to fix this stuff, and that's how I found you. Yeah. I'm like, don't Google for a diagnosis, but Google for what you're looking to solve. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that can go a long way. It's like Amazon. Yeah, you read the reviews before you buy the I re- thing. I remember now what my doctor said. Oh yeah, and yeah, he's like, here, right, 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 right. Go see this physiotherapist. So you wrote your prescription or like a referral to yeah, see, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I don't know about that, but you should just go to a physiotherapist. I'm like, okay, well, uh, thanks. I've been down that road. Yeah. Like, but again, they run out of resources or yeah. sources or yeah. ways to do it because they don't know. So it's, yeah. it's good to just be like, I don't know. All I can suggest is that you find a good physiotherapist. Then some people could say, do you have one that you recommend right. mm-hmm. or else you have to go on a journey? Just you have to admit that you don't know. Sometimes I tell people, I'm like, I'm not really familiar with that. So mm-hmm. I'm not the best person to ask. Yeah. And that I think is the best thing that you can do instead of be like, I know everything, but so this yeah. is my sure. prescription. Right. What can I do to sort of build up some of my own confidence as well as preparing myself to like what kind of questions could i be asking you to help me for that most people rely on having their person so a lot of my patients make sure that i have all their imaging because i take the time to explain because it's hard to say because a lot of people come out of conversations with their doc and feel like they were 
you know, like f- felt bad for asking a question. Yeah. I, had a, mm-hmm. I had a patient yesterday told me that she likes to ask about her medications. Like, like well, what's the risk? All this because she has yeah. diabetes. Right. But the doctor gets mad yeah. and gets frustrated and upset. And she's like, why do doctors get mad and frustrated when we ask questions? It's like, I want to know the risks of doing this yeah. and weigh it out in my mind. Like, yeah. this is crazy that we can't ask questions anymore, that it's supposed to be, well, thank you for giving me this. And yeah. I hope it doesn't hurt me yeah. and all that stuff. Like... So really, I just think that, yes, most people that come in to see me have a booklet, have all their stuff because you can request your own imaging reports and that sort of thing. And those people are experts, too, because they've been probably down a little bit of a like a long journey, too. Mm -hmm. So they're like, by now, they're they're the people that we should be talking to. Like, you carry sitting here. We have a friend that was just diagnosed with diabetes. Yes. Yeah. And I'm like, I bet you you're the best resource right now because for sure they are diving deep into Google and figuring it out. Learning totally. about, but things yeah. that are not mainstream, like this patient of mine, you know, her A1C levels, like her, her, her glucose levels and all that stuff were quite high before. She was a little bit heavier at the time, mm-hmm. inactive. Mm. You know what? She brought her levels down below a five, which is good. Right. Yeah. Just from fasting, being active, mm-hmm. trying to control her stress. Of course, we do C1 stuff and all that. But you can see the this thing and she's trying to get off the meds. But the first question she asked her doctor was, can I get off these meds? And the right. doctor said, no, nah, you're probably on them for life. Forever. That was the first thing. Yeah. Not, I think this is possible. And because right. she came and asked me right away, yeah. I said... Type 2 diabetes is fixable. You talk to any expert in the field, they'll tell you, oh, yeah, you yeah. can do a lot of, to yeah. manage it really I do well. Think, or I do get think off we're, we, right. and I'm hoping we're in a bit of a, a bubble here because I think all of our medical uh, staff, all the, all the individuals that are in our medical field right now, are very stressed. And they're like mm-hmm. inundated with patients, they're short staffed. So it might be just, it, in the, so maybe that's where that anger comes from. I don't have time, and maybe I'm almost angry at myself. I don't have time to explain this whole thing to you of why this medication's okay or why it isn't or maybe whatever, but it's just, okay, I'm done. No, just take it. But I agree with you. Yeah. It depends on the day because sometimes mm-hmm. we all have a bad day. Mm-hmm. And you know, I had – there's been really good doctors that I know who are patients of mine that went to BC because wages were reduced. Mm-hmm. They are busy. I see nurses on yes. a regular basis. It's not good. Yeah. Their stress level – makes their C1s deviate all the time. Hmm. It increases their laxity. It decreases their responsiveness. Why? Because they are constantly, because they're healthy enough, they're they're circulating that cortisol. It is destructive to their body. So I agree that things are yeah. not good. Yeah. I also think that you have to want to learn all this other yeah, stuff. Yeah, so right. it's hard. So it's, yeah. I think it's sometimes there's that a they lot don't more know. factors here. There are yeah. an ego is one for sure. Busyness is one because they have a living to make and they have to see all their patients because whenever I call my doc, it's usually about two weeks of a wait. Yeah. I'm like, really? Yeah. yeah. So I get it. Yeah. They're filled and they're seeing all these things and you can't know everything, mm-hmm. but I also think there's a standard of care because, you know, for me, I have to ask for consent. I have to inform everything, but mm-hmm. that's lost in the medical side of things, whether it is, whether people are getting injections or whatever it is, like they're not told everything. They're just told you should get a cortisone shot, yeah. not told the risks, yeah. not told that they get, it's limited on how many they could get. Just that's my advice right. to you, right. even though that is not based on evidence and research and standards, the best approach. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and I guess we could just push all that aside and just say, look, we're talking about pain mm-hmm. and which is the safest, fastest, most effective way to get out of your pain journey or to the end of your pain mm-hmm. journey. So, I mean, we could talk, we could go down that road. Mm-hmm. Totally. But, but I, I think, think we're talking about pain. I think that a new standard needs to be set yeah. of a way of healing. And, you know, for me, that's what I'm going to try to do. Yeah. And yeah. that is just my next kind of mission. Well, for is sure, there's other help. people out there. There are that band up, you know. Yes, because mm-hmm. they want. I'm sure a hundred of a hundred doctors. If you actually sat down and talked with them, they probably would agree. Mm-hmm. Right? It's just time, yeah. effort, effect, yeah. like all this other stuff, stress, whatever. Right? So. Yeah. But what I, what we need to do for me as a profession, I know my profession is mm. trying, is to just get a better reputation within the medical yeah. community, and Absolutely. I know we're trying yeah. because even this year in Alberta, we. Uh, received our ability to x-ray and ultrasound back. Oh, okay. Most provinces are different than that way, yeah. but we're getting that back so we can 
unload the docks and do all that stuff sure, so that they can idea. do what they do. Right. But that's where for me, if we can increase the standard and truly help people within this conservative manual therapy mm. treatment side and do all that, I really feel like things can shift better. Yeah. Now well, it always takes the time too. Yeah. You, it's not one doctor treating one. It's a bunch of you coming together and helping and mm-hmm. sharing the information and all of that. And I think that's a, I think that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to, at this point, check in with you, mm-hmm. Dr. Ryan, and ask you if there's anything that maybe I didn't ask or we didn't ask or you wanted to bring up that we haven't talked about today. We've covered it all. We've covered a lot. We really did. I really appreciate And it's this. really important for, for people just to see that there can be sources in their body that are not always identified by their current practitioner to say, you know, have you assessed my C1? Have you assessed my nerves, my function, my responsiveness? And if not, then maybe it's time for me to move on. So many people come to me and they're like, well, I have a chiropractor, so I feel like I'm kind of cheating on them. Yes. But I'm like, I, I don't yeah, care. It's absolutely. not about your person or this. Yeah. I know they're a great person, yeah. but you, do you have pain? Then it's time to move on yeah. and to change this so that you can see progressions. If people are not seeing progressions in their care, it's time to move on. Yeah. I can't tell you people will come and they're like, oh, yeah, I went to physio Cairo for like eight months. I was on a plan and I'm probably not that much better. I'm like, and you still went after the first month? Yeah, yeah. It blows my mind because yeah. sometimes after true treatments, if people have any pain left, they're gone. And I'm like, did you really expect after two treatments me to fix you? I know I'm good. Yeah. But <laughs> like, I'm not magical. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I just think that, yes, we have to increase the standard of care, but people need to ask for better care yeah. and just say, this is mm-hmm. not enough. What can we do? Yeah. Pain yeah. is not normal. Right. And as long as people know they the source is often a nerve. Yeah. If it's not getting better. And M L J. Yeah. It's going to be my health. From <laughs> gonna get a shirt. And also I appreciated you talking about genetic stress and trauma too, like that you look at that and, mm-hmm. and then you know how to target something. Mm-hmm. So that's, that was uh, that was a good learning. Well, too. one of the biggest things that I learned from when I saw a friend, a really good friend, personal trainer go through grief i couldn't help her i couldn't help her physically she could not sustain treatments after after everything i knew and i just knew that it was just and don't get me wrong she was seeing help and doing Mm -hmm. the right things uh and that was the only way to bring her back because there was other things that had to be dealt with so you have to recognize you can't fix everything and in that moment it might not be appropriate for that person so i'll always say i can't fix everything there's just a lot that i can help yeah but you're right with something like grief and that that trauma that's unresolved that's been sitting with us from childhood or what those things will definitely impact our physical health and our physical health will definitely impact how we handle that. And so it's great that we are seeing a doctor or, or a professional to help us with our you know, physical ailments, but it's also great that we're seeing someone to help with our well-being and our mental health because they do go hand in hand. And you talked a lot about that through your stories today and even, even you sharing yours, Carrie, like to what level you are at with your quality of life. And how, how do you look at both those things and manage those? So I think I think this conversation is a, and I say this often, but it's definitely a door opener. We, we, we t- we're talking about linking mental health to physical, physical to mental health. They are not separate. They are connected. They live in the same house, in the same building. And so I think perhaps, you know, down the way, we can maybe come back to this conversation mm-hmm. as well. And for folks that are listening as well, like we said, it, it is a door opener. And if you have any questions or any feedback that you want to give us about this conversation, you can reach us at MFU Podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Dr. Ryan, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, where would you suggest they go? Most people that, that want to ask me questions typically email me. Okay. So if you want to just add my email. Perfect. After, okay. yeah. I always welcome a conversation. Yeah. You know, most people get a lot from meeting me, but yeah. that's not always an option for everybody. Right. But as long as people just have have questions or see where they can start first that's yeah. where i would go just okay. as long as people know that you know they're not stuck where they are there's lots of options it's not about fixing it's about finding all the elements to improve yeah. each of those areas right. and yeah. it is multidimensional for most and and we don't know if we don't try 
we don't know. We don't know what can come out of it. And when we think something terrible is going to come out, well, something good can also. So I, I mm-hmm. hope people reach out and, and are just as curious. We'll put that video up. And um, if you have other videos and whatnot, you'll send me. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll put those up as well. And lastly, I just want to ask, uh, we talked about a lot of things. So if the listeners today leave with one thing that they can think about or they can go and do, what, where would you want to sort of direct them towards or lead them towards or what do you want to ask them to think about? Well, the one thing that I always want people to know is they don't have to struggle, yeah. right? Because somebody told me this once and it, it resonated with me so hard because I've always been, I can work through this, I can do all this. Why struggle? Whether it is taking a necessary medication or it is trying out a treatment and seeing if you can improve on that. Mm -hmm. Because I was always told that you're not going to get a medal for struggling, even though that was what I always did. Uh And she told me. (laughs) Well said. Yeah, it's my partner. She was like, (laughs) what? You don't have to struggle so hard. It's like if I had a pain and it's like, it's okay. If you're not relying on certain things or doing things. So we tease each other back and forth because she she would lean more to a medication. I would lean more to a treatment, right? right? But we tease each other and it's like, why struggle? If I could treat you and make it better, or she could give me a little medication, ease my pain on that day if I hurt myself or something, because mm-hmm. I work out and, and sometimes I get a little tweak and, and stuff. Mm-hmm. But she always tells me, she's like, you're not going to get a medal for sucking it up, you know? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. true. You might have just named the episode too. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're not going to get a medal for sucking. And, and that's the culture we live in. Yes. That's that. That's that piece of it. It's not just in the the masculinity world. It's all of us. Like, yeah, yeah take the pain, del- having babies, all sorts of things. Don't take the meds. Don't do this. You know, even the stigma behind different mental health medications, ADHD, all sorts of things. We're like, no, no, no. And I, I think what I hear you saying is just, you know, also be responsible. Do do some looking into. Do some mm-hmm. of your research. Ask questions. I think sometimes people that have lived that and are kind of on the path to health and recovery, those are great people to collect stats from and evidence and ask. So those stories are going to tell you, hey, maybe this is something that might benefit me. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is, is don't just be settle with, with good. Because people get into I like this how you thing, at Carrie. right? Well, because people get into this is the one thing that gives me the most relief that I've ever had, so I'm going to stick with this. But for me, with this patient recently, I was just like, really, was that the lifestyle you were going to chalk it up to? I would just tell people, if you're not getting to where you're going, keep searching. The answer is out there. I've seen a lot of answers. I've seen a lot of good things happen. We don't always have find the right resource or something, but keep searching because the answer is Mm. likely going to be out there for most people. But don't stop. If you stop, you're just giving up on yourself. And well, you could throw in the towel, but... That's mm-hmm. the easy thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's going to be hard to dig deep. And I had to because I was seeing ther- people treating me for years and years and years to get the relief I needed until I figured out what it was. Yeah. And if I look back and I just stayed on that and I just thought that was the best it was going to be, my life would be very different. Oh, you'd yeah. be one nasty Eeyore for sure. Right? Oh, yeah. I'd be grumpy <laughs> the and, worst. and all that. Yeah. 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 So I just think, don't give up. Yeah. The, there is an answer and there are almost always is better yeah. so i say keep going awesome yeah. i think that's a good mess i think that's a good place to end if uh, mm-hmm. there's nothing more for you carrie no, no just say i want to say thank you yeah. yes yeah. yeah thank you so much for coming on i agree with carrie we like we said we were a little nervous we we're excited there's all sorts of planning put in place for this episode so i'm really glad that you were able to carve out the time to come sit down mm-hmm. in a little studio and chat with us hopefully we get to see you again absolutely in the future let's do it perfect thank you Thank you.